now it's uh, 938 and we were, we're gonna be in open session in accordance with uh, Governor Baker, March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law C30A chapter 20, the open session portion of this meeting will be held remotely in an online conference mode hosting, hosted on zoom.com and members of the public will not be able to physically attend. The meeting will be broadcasted live on Comcast channel 12 and will subsequently be broadcasted on youtube.com. Um, may we please rise for a Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge of allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United States, United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God with liberty, invisible. justice for all. And as customary, uh, we'd like to hold a moment of silence. Uh, hope everyone stayed safe uh, during this last snowstorm. Okay, our first uh, applicant is not until 9.30. So Bernie, it's still uh, got five minutes to go. If you want to uh, discuss anything with the rest of the board about the, the process today and how we're gonna work with it. Sure, um, actually, uh, Dan had asked, uh, you know, we kind of talked a little bit before the meeting started that uh, I'll be uh, asking the questions or giving the qu prompts to the questions um, as I think I indicated, I write these questions as if they're verbatim, but I'm going to sort of work around and sort of, uh, uh, they'll be a little bit more informal because what we want is we want to have a discussion with these candidates, a dialogue. So I'll ask questions and um, start to dig into certain areas with them. And, and uh, I encourage the board members to jump in where you uh, see appropriate if you want additional information or you want to, um, question them on their specific experiences or um, um, approaches to problem solving. Uh, again, I, I intend this to be a, a dialogue. This is the way we've, we've worked this in um, all of our communities and uh, we've gotten a good feedback from that. But uh, so definitely do that. And then at the end, I'll leave it open for um, you to um, ask any other questions that we don't have there that you might have uh, in your heads, particularly after uh, uh, we've gone through the process. So that's hey, happy, to be, happy to take any questions that board members may have um, regarding that. And otherwise- Does anybody have any questions of Bernie in the process? Right. Saying now, what we'll do is each applicant comes in, I will introduce the board to them so he knows who we are. And then once that's done, Bernie will take over and, and start asking the questions. That seem plausible for the rest of the board working in? Yeah. Looks good. All right. Well, our first candidate is here. So if we want to get a sort of a jump start on the, uh, the morning, we're ready to go. Sure. All right. Hey, Peter, how Hi. are you? Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you. Good morning, Peter. Um, just one, uh, just wanted. Uh, my name's Dan Salbucci. I'm acting chairman of the board of selectmen. We have uh, in attendance today Kyle Kowalski, who is a, of course is a member. We have Brian Vizanson, who is a member. We have Justin Evans, a member, and Randy Lamatina, who is a member. Um, and of course, Lisa is uh, not in attendance, basically for the fact that. Uh, you know, she's one of the applicants, so understood. But she's, you know, yeah. as town administrator. Sure, and apologize for the dog barking in the background. Uh, we're babysitting my daughter's dog here, so uh, excuse me don't worry that. about it because I think my cat, when it, once it wakes up from napping, will be walking across the screen. Like yeah, I've seen that actually happen to you. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, well, not when I just chase the cat away. Yeah. Okay, uh, Bernie, would you like to begin the process? I, I will begin the process, uh, and of course, Peter uh, Sharon is here from Community Paradigm. So, uh, you know, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, I should you, introduce Sharon. Never. No, no, that's right. Uh, and I guess I, my first question is: uh, You look different than the last time I saw you. Did, are you 
you know, um, what's what's the are you trying to you know be like Brian with the beard or? Well, I mean, he's much better with the beard. I I'm growing it for uh, in uh, a fundraiser for uh, my chief's uh, wife passed away this summer, so it's a fundraiser. So my wife says uh, I try to tell her I look like the most interesting man in the world, but she's not buying that. Right. <laughs> she, she thinks I look like uh, maybe a scruffy Santa Claus, but uh, much that. <laughs> maybe I should just write the check. I'm yeah, used to had, being clean shaven. We had to do these interviews, uh, you know, this uh, by today because uh, Brian's busy next week uh, mm. with his. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's get into the uh, let's get into the real serious stuff here. So the board has the board has seen your resume. They've seen the reference requirements that people have provided regarding uh, you and uh, what you've accomplished. But if you could just take a few minutes, we've got about an hour, a little bit more maybe, to just get a feel for you and your uh, you know understanding of municipal government, the issues. Uh, so tell us about yourself and what what drew you to apply to this job. Sure. Um, so as you can see, I have a private sector background, uh, MBA in finance and accounting. Spent a number of years as an auditor for largest CPA firm in Boston. Went off to my favorite client, Puma, uh, which, uh, you know, after I wrote down their inventory by 30 million bucks, they asked me to join them. And uh, I went in over their, uh, you know, existing financial guy. He remained and we worked together. Um, moved on into a couple of uh, some retail activities, uh, some private sector uh, startups, as you can see, some in education. And then most recently in, uh, in industrial clean tech uh, businesses, one of which was my own. So uh, the business was large industrial ceiling fans and raised my kids in uh, Sherburn. They were part of the Dover Sherburn educational system. Uh, four kids uh, all went through it. Um, and I don't know, it was probably 15 years ago, I got a tax bill that broke the $10,000 barrier. And I was just living in a regular home in Sherburn. And I, Thought, oh my gosh, what's going on here? So I started digging into it where before I hadn't paid attention and uh, wound up going to an advisory. Uh, they have an advisory committee, which is finance plus everything else. Uh, went to a public hearing, asked a few questions. I had done a little research trying to figure out why the average household in Sherburne was paying $1,000 more than the average household in Dover for the for this, uh, high school and middle school. And uh, you know, I wanted to understand that better. So I asked a few questions. I asked about um, uh, unfunded liabilities, legacy liabilities, as I call them. So next thing you know, the moderator called me and said, yeah, let's go to lunch. And she asked me to join the uh, advisory committee. And so I did. And boy, did I learn a lot. When, you, when you're when you on a finance committee, you know, if you, if you dig into it, you can spend an enormous amount of time, which I did. And uh, I found I asked a lot of questions. I got to know a lot of people, both in the community and also within you know the administration school and in uh, town administration and you know i found that rewarding and i was good at understanding stuff so i kept at it and then sooner or later i became a selectman and you know i was a liaison to the schools uh while on advisory as well as uh, as a board of selectmen and uh, you know continued to learn more and more and i thought man i i kind of like this and uh and i'm good at it and so as i wound down my uh, business, I thought, this is something I could do and, and, you know, in sort of a later in life uh, career shift. And so, you know, I started chasing down some town opportunities and was fortunate to get the opportunity in Millville, um, which is a great community. Um, it's been, you know, it's terrific. It's problem is it's a little bit far away for me. And, uh, you know, I just can't seem to be able to move there. So started looking for uh, a couple of other opportunities that Bernie, uh, you know, presented, and here we are. Um, uh, your community, I kind of like. You've got some uh, unique things about it. You've got this town center. You're small and compact. You've got the regional schools, which I know quite a bit about, I think. Um, you've got some challenges. You've got some pretty big challenges in your legacy liabilities, all things that are in my, you know, wheelhouse that I've uh, come to know about. So, Here's an opportunity worth exploring. I'm very happy in Millville, but it's a great opportunity to explore. So here I am. Okay, great. Well, I want to get into the, a lot of the, uh, your background in finance, and we have a lot of uh, finance questions, uh, I would say, for you. But first, I want to get an understanding of your, um, well, let me ask you this first. Where, does, where would Whitman fall into your, your career arc? 
you said this was a second career, a second career for you, uh, yes. you know, uh, an encore career. Is that the appropriate term or something? Well, I think so. Not, it's, you know, people, I, people call it all sorts of things, but you know, what are we looking at with uh, a Peter Caruso as town administrator? What, what, what's your plan of how you would uh, sort of look at it in terms of uh, tenure and? Uh, well, that's a fair question. I, I think I look at it as it would be, you know, I'm looking to do this until I can't walk, I guess. And, uh, and I think you can, it's the kind of career similar to say a, a law career where you, you're the older you get, uh, the, you know, the more experience you get, the better you are at it. And I find that, that to be the case here. I'd like to think, uh, well, at least convince myself that. Um, but in any event, this is uh, one of those things where I like, to, you know, I'm not going to sail off into the sunset. My wife won't do that. Our family is all mostly all here, you know, so we're grounded in this region. Um, again, you know, Millville's great. And if I sail off into the sunset there, uh, if you will, that, you know, that may be, but uh, like I say, it's pretty far away, so. Um. Okay, all right. Well, let's talk about uh, your, your, how you manage, how you've managed in your private sector career, but also, and perhaps, and obviously more importantly, uh, what's, how you manage your, uh, your people in Millville. Uh, mm -hmm. Millville is a relatively small town. Um, a, a town, as we'll, we'll discuss, has a lot of issues that you've had to grapple with, but uh, talk to me about, uh, talk to us about, how you manage the organization and how you manage uh, sort of the, the role of being town administrator. Sure. Well, for, there's a lot to learn. So I'm learning something every day. Um, and you depend on, you know, the subject matter experts for success. You know, the better your police chief is, the better the town is and the better you can serve your purpose. Um, I try to develop, help people be the best they can be. I, I'm not the I'm not the guy cutting down the trees, but I, you know I can help the guy figure out perhaps which trees to cut down, or at least uh, you know support him in his decision making. And uh, likewise, if you've got a town clerk, I work with a town clerk. She's independently elected, as you folks have, um, and uh, she's a you know an elected employee, if you will, and. Boy, I can recognize all the work that that person does. I try to work with her, support her, and, and likewise, she supports me. And at the same time, we're, you know, we, we, we can have laughs along the way. I think that's pretty important, have a sense of humor. Um, you want to, I try to earn people's respect, whether it's been in the private sector or here. I've managed different types of people from, you know, clerical people to warehouse people to PhDs to MDs. I mean, I, you know, engineers I found are the, some of the more challenging ones to uh, manage. No, no offense to any engineers, but you know my approach to them are uh, help them uh, come, help them come to the decision that they think they've made on some solution uh, is one of the ways to work it. So you you change your style of how you interact with people depending on you know what roles they have, how they communicate. You try to get everybody on the same page and give credit where credit's due. I'm very big on that. I, you know, I need, I, I have no need to take credit for something. So, okay. The, um, when you're working with these departments, uh, you, if some of them have, you know, you mentioned they have subject matter experts, um, and you're a subject matter expert as town administrator. Uh, what would you say that is? What would you say you're the expert at? Well, yeah, uh, 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 I'm surprised at how much uh, financial director type stuff has come into play in the role. Uh, I didn't expect that. Now, yeah, you know, yeah, I've been a CFO of companies. I've been a CPA, as I say. More recently, most of my efforts have been on product development and marketing and sales. And so then I got back into this and I was surprised. Uh, and, and it's partly the way the design of a you know, municipal government is you got different people performing different roles and responsibilities. You've got a town accountant that can do only so much. You've got a treasurer who does certain things. You've got the assessors. And so you have to pull all of those pieces together. So part of it is, um, you know, driving a bus full of, a, you know, or it's, you know, the joke, I'm sure you all heard herding cats, uh, but it's, you know, it's driving a bus. All, all, all people come from different walks of life and experiences and you have to help all go in the same direction. You have to, in a town administrator, from what I found, you, 
particularly in a smaller community, you wear many hats. So you have to be reasonably expert at a whole bunch of different subject matters, enough to know um, where the challenges are and to saw how best to solve the problems. Um, so when you're when you're in there and you're you're trying to make change within the organization, and how do you go about doing that, and how do you handle uh, people who um, department heads who don't want to head in the direction you want to head or uh, push back at you? Well, I'm bigger. No, I'm bigger than no. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I mean, you really uh, part of it is having a command of facts. So to the extent you can understand the facts, appreciate their differences of opinion and their, the facts upon which they base their decisions and differences. Um, together, I think you, you can ultimately get on the same page. And some of it's give and take, some of it's uh, uh, and a bit of enlightenment on both sides. You know, there may be aha moments uh, for whoever's involved in terms of here's how I see it. And did you understand it this way? And I can't say that we have differences, but I'll, I'll give you an example. I work with a building commissioner and a building commissioner can be someone that has to say no to people that may not be too thrilled about it. And, you know, the question is, uh, how do we treat people and how do we make sure that one, we go by the book, but two, to the extent there's gray area that we utilize that gray area if it's in the best interest of the town and make sure we're also treating everybody equally and you know so he'll come to me i i don't know code necessarily but he'll ask me questions and uh, i help him find the right solution to a problem he may be facing um, you know, right. sounding so, board. so they come to you as a sounding board that raises a, another question for me though about a you know and i as you know i've been a town manager i've been a city manager there's a lot that goes into the, these jobs as you know yes. uh and you're being pulled in many different directions. How do you maintain, uh, do you ever tell people not to, not to uh, sort of not to come see you that you've got too much work to do? Or how no, do you maintain that accessibility? No, I think to be successful, you have to be um, able to prioritize. And as part of that priority setting, um, it needs to be flexible. At all times you need to be, I mean, you're at, you're there to serve as well. So you, you can't say no, stay away. You can't really close the door. Uh, obviously, if you're in a meeting or a call or something, you know, people are gonna have to wait perhaps, but you gotta give folks full attention. And that's the other part of it is uh, whether it's a resident or a, you know someone you're working with or a volunteer on a committee, it's, it's best if you can give them your full attention and not be distracted, you know, I think. Okay, good. So maintaining accessibility. One of the um, one of the uh, sort of key tenets of leadership is modeling the way. Do you feel that you model the way in your position? And I'll give you an example. Let's let's you know. There's been a lot of uh, press of late of uh, uh, public leaders who, uh, in the midst of this COVID crisis, tell people to do one thing, and then they do something different. Right. Right. Yeah. What are your I, thoughts on that? Well, that, that I don't care for. Um, uh, uh, modeling the way, I don't know. I, yes, you're a role model. Yes, you, uh, you know, yes, I understand that what I say matters. Yes, I understand what I do matters. And, you know, so I just have to be who I am. And, you know, I was raised to be, always tell the truth, be honest. And, uh, you know, if I don't know something, try to find it out and ask questions <clears throat> and ask them diplomatically. So, um, you know, I'm, the other way to look at someone is, you know, how if they have children, what kind of kids did they raise? You know, and uh, yeah, I you know I take pride in that. So, um, okay, yeah, I model. I you have to earn their respect. You have to earn everybody's respect. You you have to be a straight shooter. You you. you they have to trust what you're saying is in fact what you believe in. And if you yeah. don't know something, admit to it. You know. How important is ethics in your position as town administrator? Oh, absolutely critical. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, you don't, first of all, you don't want to be in the news, right? right. Um, 
but you you know ethics are in, very important because you're you know the way I look at it in, in in the role in Millville for example you know that's a wonderful community and I'm there to help them be the best they can be and the last thing I'm going to do is uh, you know just uh, how shall I say I'm not going to do anything that serves my purposes. I'm only there to serve other purposes. I don't respect people who may make decisions from which they benefit. That can get my Irish up. And I'm half Irish. You have the name like Caruso. You're not Irish. Yeah, I'm uh, half Irish. Half sorry. Irish. All right. Uh, so, from a, um, you wouldn't use your office then for personal gain. Absolutely not. How do you motivate people and then how do you hold them accountable? Yeah, so there's a, you know, I, you know, I don't know. It's a, it's an art and a science, I guess. Uh, you motivate them uh, by helping them see that it's in their best interest to uh, do whatever it is you need them to do. And, you know, it's not do it my way or the highway. It's here's why we want to do something. And you help try to explain it to them and the value of it. You know, I tend not to be one that's going to ask people to do something for busy work. I, I, I only ask, if I ask, it's important that it be done as, you know, something be done or be done a certain way. Um, but I'm, as a, you know, back to the priorities, I, I, I pick the, I pick the uses and particularly where, you, you know, the personnel resources and financial resources are always limited, it's always stretched and strained. And so you can't put the burden on somebody. And then you throw in this COVID situation and you know, I recognize that, you know, we have people coming into town hall, we've been able to provide services seamlessly, that's all them not, you know, I say we but it's, you know, my peeps, if you will. And uh, I know that it, lurking in the back of their brains is stress and strain from the code, they may not be able to articulate it, but it's there. And uh, so, you know, we're doing a bit of a delicate dance to make sure that people remain healthy, remain motivated and don't feel the personal stress of what of the unknowns of geez if the next person i interact with is infected do i get infected you know that sort of thing is really underlying a lot today um, okay. right. let's get into sort of a nuts and bolts unless someone has a question the board members will be jumping in at various times uh in this dialogue that we're having but let's talk about <laughs> nuts and bolts and probably uh uh given you what you've uh, talked about already right up your alley uh, you know, you talked about limited resources and limited personnel. Well, let's talk about resources. Let's talk about um, money, finance. Uh, what is your role within the town of Millville uh, in terms of, uh, and what's been your, the, uh, your experience with budget prep preparation? Sure. So uh, under their bylaws, I'm in, I guess, in effect, a, a strong town administrator. So it's my role to bring to the Board of Selectmen a budget every year. And included in that is uh, the budget for the schools, believe it or not. And it's regional schools, all regional, okay, pre-K through 12. They have the same rack situation you folks went through. Um, the, um, and so there's that. So right now, uh, we're not on the same time frame you are. Uh, Monday night, the board will be um, reading my budget guidance letter. I look to get their support. I look to get the finance committee support on the same budget guidance. We implemented that last year. Uh, I, I basically have, you know, uh, I explain sort of personnel raises that may be allowed under this budget cycle, uh, what we're doing on uh, spending for expenses. So in this case, we're level funding uh, a range of uh, where we could go for the schools. And this year, uh, one of my pet ones is, of course, uh, a, as Bernie may know, OPEBs and, you know, legacy liabilities. And like you, our regional schools have so far done nothing about their OPEBs and the liability is growing substantially. Yours is pretty jaw dropping. Um, so uh, in this budget guidance this time around, I've actually, uh, we, we've had talk, this is my third cycle with them. There's been talk from the school leadership um, that they're going to do something, but I, I'm, you know, I'm just going to force it. Um, and, and that's probably a strong word, but uh, that's kind of what I'm doing, where I'm requiring that within the range that I'm putting in my budget guidance for the schools that I will present to the board, maybe a different number than they come up with. And we'll, we'll work together on that, but we'll work it out. 
um, but right now the guidance is X percent. And within that must be a, what I call material and meaningful contribution to the OPEBs. So there's a challenge. I put a stake in the ground on that one and I'm gonna fight hard on that. And, and, and I, I, fight is not the right word because I, I work well, the school administration, the school committee, you know, chair and all that, you know, they're, they're on board and trying to, it, we're, we're, we're together in this to try to solve the problems. They, it's their problem as well as the town's problem, what, what they're facing with both both on that sort of that issue as well as of course their uh, the challenges of you know if you have steps and lanes like you folks do um, you, you know somebody goes from m8 to m9 there's a six and a half percent increase if they go from m8 to m9 plus 15 there's a nine percent increase you have in your current contract with the, the teachers you know how do you sustain that in the proposition two and a half limitations that's a challenge and uh, so everybody's in on that challenge you know, I have a whole bunch of finance questions for you, Peter, to gauge your understanding of municipal finance, but and to um, for the uh, for the board. But um, talk to me about Proposition Two and a Half. Explain it to me. <clears throat> How well, Proposition Two and a Half. So, works. so Proposition Two and a Half. Uh, it's it's pretty simple. What did we have last year that we had in our levy? And let's increase it by two and a half plus some new growth. <laughs> Uh, do we use it all? Do we go above it? How do we go above it? Are we going to use free cash? And geez, that's not typically advisable. Do we have financial policies that help guide us in what we do with that? Um, we're working on that um, in Millville uh, with the Finance Committee. Um, so I, I use the, I sort of picked the number that, uh, that derives from that. What can we use for that uh, and work within that in my guidance? Um, in years past, uh, you know, just the prior year before I got on board, you know, our schools took two and a, two, twice the what proposition two and a half allowed, um, you know, and that's not a sustainable model. So they had to chew up free cash and they had to eat up, you know, DPW budgets and, you know, town hall budgets and who knows what else to kind of make up the nut. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how, <clears throat> let me ask you a question on that. Um, Sort of, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, Whitman uh, faced, uh, not the past year or two, I don't think, but looking at some of their numbers, they went several years where they had excess levy capacity. Um, how does that happen? I, I guess you weren't going to the, use the full two and a half percent. And, uh, and you know, maybe you had some, uh, you know, uh, you had some debt service that was outside the levy. I, I think the more recent, that's a discussion you're dealing with now, converting some of your debt that you're doing within your operating budget and bringing it out as, uh, you know, excluded debt or. Okay. We'll see where that all goes. How, how should, how should excess levy capacity, um, I guess the question is how should excess levy capacity occur? I guess in your mind, as your as as, as, your, as, a, as a town administrator, um, what is your what's your what are your thoughts on excess levy capacity? Um, I think if you're at a point where you have excess levy capacity and it's material, I I, I don't I, I don't know how you've gotten to that point except uh, by not uh, utilizing all that's available to you over time. Um, but you're probably not going to retain that. And I see that you don't have that these days, nor does okay. Millville. We chewed it all up. Uh, we're down to 1800 bucks, I think. And you guys were less than four grand, I think, in the most recent thing I saw. Okay. So you don't have a lot of, you have none. You're, you're, you're spread to the max. So that doesn't allow you too much opportunity for generating free cash. And you're, you know, you're really skipping along. How, how have you, you know, how have you projected your revenues? I read your Madden report with great interest and, you know, that he, he addresses some of that uh, where you're, you're really pushing the envelope in terms of your revenue projections each year. And clearly as you strain budgets, your surpluses or turnbacks uh, continue to decline. Millville's facing the same thing. You know, the days of, of free cash generation that the town might've seen in the past are, uh, continuing to be a challenge going forward. And, uh, but at the same time, you know, when I was in Sherburne, I, you know, I was on the board with a, a gentleman who's been on the board for many, many years. And, 
he was congratulating the, uh, you know, the town accountant for reporting that we had a surplus of many, many hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, you know, from my perspective, I thought, well, maybe we were overtaxing if we continue to generate that type of surplus. So there's a, you know, there's a balance. I, there's no really obvious answer to that balance, but it's a balance you have to be uh, alert to. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think people like to be overtaxed. You know, you know, as for example, in your Madden reports, you you know, he put some scenarios which are useful for you all to look at and address. You know, discuss. But if you take the uh, the scenario of say a five million dollar override, well, then you you know, his projections show multi million dollar. Uh, surpluses in the first few years. So those first few years, arguably, you're you're overtaxing people. That's one way to look at it. But, you know, it, it really is up to the, the folks. So in Millville, prior to my coming on board, but as part of my due diligence, I watched their finance committee bring forth a you know I don't know it was a million dollar override, but the but the but the deficit that they were trying to make up was only a couple hundred grand, and so. It, it wasn't well articulated, people couldn't understand it, and it was voted down and there was a element of trust that was uh, lost uh, because people were like, why are you asking us for a million bucks when you don't need it? And uh, so part of my job has been trying to help bring back some trust and also clarity of understanding of what, what folks are really dealing with. Okay, what role do financial policies have in all of this? Uh, they're, a, they're a good guideline. They're like, uh, if you had a, like you, I know you're all working on a master plan, but a financial policies force the discussion, you know, are, are useful. Well, I won't say force, they're useful for the discussion of both the finance committee, the, the administration, and, and the, of course, the board of selectmen to get onto a reasonably the same page as to what we do. If we are generating free cash, what, uh, what types of free cash we, levels we want to have, what, what we want to do with it once we have it. Uh, do we, you know, you, in Millville, we address stabilization funds. We address, you know, how we, you know, some, some of the policies can be general, but good general objectives, uh, you know, almost like a mission statement. It, it, it gives you, you have to be flexible, but at least gives you a, 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 an objective to strive for. Okay. Uh, were those policies in place when you got to Millville? No, so uh, I, you know, I got policies in place in Sherburne, and Millville. Right now, we have draft policies, which are basically uh, those that I brought forth in Sherburne, um, adapted for Millville, um, and it's with the finance committee. You, you know, they're I'm helping them on that, um, and you know, then it's folks getting together in time to do it. So uh, it's priority setting. It'd be nice that we got everybody on the same. So we're not they're not finalized. They're in draft form right now. Okay. What role does uh, fiscal forecasting play in your financial? Yeah, world? you know, we're playing catch up on that. I think it's more of, a, you know, so we don't have a structural forecast uh, set up right now. Um, it's an objective we would like to put out for three years, for example, on the budgeting side and so forth. But we don't have the, the resources, personnel resources, nor is it the highest priority right now. So, but we know that we have, you know, things that are uh, coming down the roadway that we have to address. And those are capital items. Those are, of course, our budget challenges that will continue to grow. You know, how do we sustain the quality of the schools? They have, you know, declining enrollment. Uh, how, are, how are they staffing to keep up with the declining enrollment and all of that uh, is in the pre-COVID mindset. Now we have COVID and what's the post-COVID mindset going to be? And you, you, you know, I, uh, the post-COVID world, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, municipal budgeting or it's, you know, uh, commercial development or, you know, housing development, uh, I think folks have to think differently than they might have thought nine months ago um, on the long term. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Whitman has a water, water and sewer systems. Do you, uh, how, how, how do uh, water and, do you know how water and sewer rates, or do you have any thoughts on how water and sewer rates should be set? Well, I, I, I don't have experience with the enterprise types of funds, except to say that I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at knowing what the identifying real costs and making sure they're captured 
properly or and if they're not at least you know that they're not being captured so um you know in terms of uh, water and sewer i in millville everybody's on uh, private wells and septic the school the elementary school is a public water supply and i am i work with mass dep and our water operator i'm the point person for the town on uh, that public water supply, how we treat it, green sand filters, uh, you know, I could go on and on. I had to dust off old chemistry books to get smart about that. And I deal with uh, Worcester Mass DEP um, and they're challenging, I'll just, I'll just say that. Um, but so, you know, looking at you guys, I think from what I can figure out, you have uh, the Brockton supplies you the water, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, first question, particularly if you think about what you're going to do with the train station area, you know, is uh, is that supply unlimited and the duration of the relationship, uh, you know, forever? I don't know those things, but I'd wonder about that. Okay. Uh, what's been your most challenging budget situation? Well, uh, in in. In Sherburn, for example, and I, we were very, as the fun, at advisory committee. I was the numbers guy, and also on the on the board of selectmen, I was the numbers guy. And we were very deep and in, deeply involved in the budget, more so than say, you know, Millville. I'm the one deeply involved. Uh, Finance committee is very deeply involved. So we were dealing with uh, a, a major gap, um, a deficit, if you will, that we were trying to make up. And so I had to get creative with the way the schools dealt with circuit breaker reimbursement. In years past, the schools did not budget for any reimbursement, and it wound up being a, an annual turn back of a significant amount. And so I had to do a one time. I, I engineered it was the, the, the then superintendent wasn't too thrilled about it, but I engineered where we took in a, a one time benefit of starting to project the circuit breaker money, a portion of the circuit breaker monies come in to offset the, uh, you know, the out of district costs and the out of district costs were, you know, rising out of control. And, you know, so I was asking questions like, geez, are we a, are we a, you know, are we a, a sped magnet is the term that we used. And the superintendent did a, you know, an outside study and came back and the answer was, well, yes, we were. And, uh, you know, how can we deal with that? And, you know, the, the, the best solution in dealing with out of district and SPED and, you know, uh, how you handle all that was to have a very good, capable director of special education. That was probably the most important thing. And make sure you're, you're you know, the, the school, the plans that were put in place for the students and so forth were uh, as economic as well as effective. And, okay. And they turned it around. We spent a lot of time talking about the uh, the operating budget. Well, what's your uh, what is your uh, process that you use in Millville for capital? What's the criteria, and how do you uh, and what are your thoughts on how you fund the capital budget? Yeah, so uh, the capital uh, by the bylaws, it's a five year useful life. It's uh, uh, ten thousand dollars or more is the determination. I think you have lower thresholds in uh, in Whitman. Um, and we have a capital planning committee or program committee as it's technically called. I'm a voting member of that under the bylaws. It was dormant for a number of years when I first got in. Uh, that's one of the first things we got going again. Now we have a, a full membership and it's very active. Um, and we've been doing some leading edge types of, uh, you know, we're looking out the, the five year capital plans. We're working with department heads on their immediate needs. We look to see which items we can fund through debt. Sometimes we're dealing with leasing, which is is a is an easier answer, perhaps, but not necessarily the right way to go. And I think uh, Whitman does that a bit I, from the Madden report. Um, you know, so we have a very strong capital committee, um, and we have good department heads who are you know mindful of the limitations of resources and what they're asking for. We're not a, you know, we don't have as much of an operation. We don't have as much equipment, but at the same time, you know, you know, we got to buy cruisers. We got to deal with an ambulance. We got to deal with, you know, highway trucks. We've got to do all that stuff. And, you know, it's a limited scale. So actually each, each one is uh, viewed very carefully and uh, we have to be sure that the voters understand the need. And 
and we and the challenge is do you defer maintenance or do you try to keep something going longer than you should and then you're you know next you know and as an example our ambulance is probably two years beyond its useful life and three of uh, recent runs it literally died in the driveway of the hospital trying to drop somebody off and and you know so we, we our uh, state senator has put in an earmark for a new ambulance this spring and uh, he, we you know otherwise we have it's on our capital list for upcoming here um, to buy a new ambulance and that's a big purchase for a town of Millville. Uh, how do you, do you let me ask you about that that sort of ties back to my water and sewer question do you run that as an enterprise no or? no no, no. So what we do, uh, actually, our ambulance fees fit. We have a, a just went through a bylaw change uh, a couple of years ago. So 50 percent of our ambulance revenues go into a public safety stabilization fund. The remaining 50 percent go to uh, the operations. And so we have a healthy amount in that public safety stabilization fund is which is used for purchasing things whether it's ambulance related fire department related or even cruisers and and other things separately our you know in millville we're small enough so our police chief is also our fire chief and we have on call <laughs> fire department so he's my best buddy and and i'm growing the beard on his behalf here if you will um he's very capable runs a tight ship uh, over time is literally $10,000 or less in the police department. I, you know, that's almost unheard of. Um, when I look at Sherburn, we were generating right now, they're generating overtime of about $400,000 a year. And it's not that much bigger a yeah. community as far as number of people. Um, so that, uh, so no enterprise fund, <coughs> you know, I see how you're, you know, Madden report made some suggestions, you know, you really kind of picked your, how you split up the, revenues to save versus uh, cover operations i understand you have the strong fire chief to which uh, he has uh, authority to spending and that you know all those are good reasons and good good approaches uh going jumping back to capital for a second but from a little bit different perspective um have you ever had the opportunity to present to a uh, rating agency I've sat in when I was on the advisory committee and then on the board of selectmen. I sat in on a, a couple of uh, phone calls with the underwriters and the rating agencies for Sherburn. Okay. And this is really when I was smart about OPEBs, but not much of the rest of the world was, including the rating agency and underwriter folks. And so um, we on the advisory committee in Sherburn at the time we had the treasurer the town accountant in the room but it was the finance committee answering their questions <laughs> yeah. that that didn't seem right to me but that's how it was what would you if you were presenting to a rating agency um what would you tell them about uh, the community that you're how would you make your case for the community you're representing well so you, you know i think you have to be pretty open and help them understand what the you know what you're doing to plan for save for if you will and you know and i'll just go go to again millville you know we we have some pretty healthier and healthier each year stabilization accounts that folks have focused on so when we have free cash we're limiting how we use it um to offset any deficits in the budget and we try to put a the majority of it into our stabilization accounts <clears throat> and so that then provides for us, let's say we want to buy um, a cruiser now, we want to use our public safety stabilization fund. Well, now we need voters, you know, a two thirds vote to make that happen. So that gives even more say to the voters. We like that. In terms of what you tell the rating agencies, you know, I guess you have to be responsive. Uh, uh, you know, you've got financial statements, audited financial statements, which, um, in my view, typically aren't disclosing enough about relationships of uh, the community with um, the regional, um, you know, the, the commitments you have. And <clears throat> I think you, like Millville, have absorbed a greater uh, written commitment, if you will, by way of your regional agreement uh, modification, because in there, if you look at, you know, what happens, and I see the news about discussions, if the 
the towns were to dissolve, you've now added assumption of the liability for the OPEBs, where, you know, when we went through that, that was one of the items that I was concerned about <clears throat> in our uh, efforts. A lot of efforts went into our regional agreement changes. We came up with pretty much the same boilerplate. So I wonder, I hope we didn't spend a lot of money for that boilerplate. Um, <clears throat> but in any event, you know, one of the items that bothered me was to have that that wording put in because it basically creates a contingent liability that, in my view, wasn't there before. And I did go to legal counsel for consultation and they confirmed my belief. That said, you know, that's not speaking about the, the moral obligation, if you will, or what's the right thing to do. It's really just, you know, if you look at the black and white, <clears throat> that was not a commitment before in writing, but it is now. And uh, that should be disclosed in the financial statements of the town. Uh, one last finance question. <clears throat> um, who does the recap sheet in uh, Millville? So my town accountant does that and he's an outside service provider. Um, and so he and I actually, so I, I review it and he, he works with our assessor who's also an outside service provider, but they're effectively our people and I'm their boss. Right. Um, and so we worked together and they came forward with their first go round and there was an oops in it. And I'm, you know, I'm a backstopper. That's what I do in part. And uh, I found the oops and we fixed the oops and that solved some problems for us. Okay. All right. So you, you, you participated then in that process. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Let's move on to projects. What's been the, the most complex project that you've managed, um, would you say? So, uh, well, the most complex project would be my business, creating my business from a blank sheet of paper into a, you know, a international uh, uh, sales of, uh, and, you know, building complex widgets, uh, one of which is, you know, one form of which is patented. Um, in the municipal side of things, <clears throat> um, you know, right now we're dealing with uh, uh, just put in at the school. It's it's managed by our you know regional school administration. It's MSBA funded. It's a whole new boiler, and that project uh, began when I first started in Millville, and we're just ready uh, this weekend. They're actually going to test the test run the thing. Um, and it's uh, you know total replacement of boilers, uh, going from uh, you know oil fired boilers to propane. And the challenge was uh, it, right now there's a, a submarine that uh, if you will it's an 18,000 gallon propane tank under the ground right under the window of the cafeteria of uh, the the elementary school. And there have been a number of fits and starts to get to the point we're at, <clears throat> I don't, you know, so my building inspector and commissioner and I've been actively involved in making sure that the right things are done at the right time. They haven't been done at the right time. That's been part of the problem. And so we've kind of had to stand firm on the way we uh, apply the, you know, how we issue permits or, or don't issue permits. Uh, we had to do a a license for the underground storage tank and that required uh, a deeper dive into what the heck was going on and what they were doing and why um, i'm at, frankly anxious to see what happens when they actually get it going because not part of the scope of the project was the actual uh, water hot water distribution within the building and it's original to the building so i sure hope that we don't see you know, problems with that after the fact. It was not within the scope of the project. I, I certainly wish it had been uh, and asked that it be considered. Okay. Right. Uh, you, uh, you, uh, you know, you're familiar with the procurement laws of the Commonwealth? I sure am. All right. Yeah. Have you been, do you have your MCPPO? I do not. Uh, I've taken the course, uh, the first course. I'm slated to take the second course and, you know, then I'll take the third. Um, so do I have a lot of experience there? No, I do not. Um, do I view that as a big challenge? No, I do not. Uh, do I understand what the rules are and how to go about things? Yes, I do. Okay. 
Uh, let's talk about economic development. Um, what um, you, you mentioned uh, that you've, you're familiar, you've driven around Whitman, you've seen, uh, where do you see the opportunities for development uh, in Whitman? So you're, you're not a particularly large geographic area. <laughs> um, you're unique in your downtown. I mean, I, a Sunday I walked through your, uh, walked around your downtown and, you know, it probably has unrealized potential. It has current challenges and I'm sure it's probably seen better days, but I, but, but, but you, you can't find too many communities that have that kind of a downtown. So that's pretty special. <clears throat> you also have that train station now in the pre COVID world, that's pretty unbelievable in the post COVID world. I don't know. Um, and, my son, he's a he, he he's a he's a ferry captain for Boston Harbor Cruises. You know, uh, they're basically shutting everything down other than now two runs. So he's having to think about what's he going to be when he grows up. You know, um, I I don't know what the long term prospects are, but that certainly is a, you know, I always picked where I lived uh, based on having access to the commuter rail because the commuter rail is pretty unbelievable. Um, that said, you know, my wife works, uh, works for a large company that uh, probably isn't going to go back to their offices for six months or a year. Likewise, my daughter, same thing. The big the company she works for has two large buildings in Boston. Nobody's in them right now. And nobody's planning to go to them in the next six to six months or more. Um, so <clears throat> that's a challenge. But you, so the other thing is you have, uh, I read a little bit about 40R and 40S and, you know, the incentives that the state seemed to provide. And the S part is particularly interesting in terms of how that works for you, should you be full of kids in that thing and how that, whether you get crushed on your uh, regional agreement and the cost of education or the S part, the state support <clears throat> covers most or some of that nut. Um, that'll be interesting. Also, the water challenges that you ha might have with that to, to the extent you get something of a large development. Also, whether the community wants that. I guess you'd probably have to cut down a few trees to do something in there. And I don't know who owns the trees or the property, but um, those are all good good problems to solve, I guess, is the way I would put that. Go ahead, Justin. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Peter, you touched on something that um, I was going to ask you about. Uh, so do you have experience working with 40R or 40S um, projects? No, I don't. I, I'll tell you what I do have experience is a 40B that went up across the street uh, for me in Sherburn. It was a 30 acre parcel and it was it's still 15 years in the making. And, uh, you know, it, 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 if they put the 185 beds in there, it's going to crush the town if they're full of kids because of the regional agreement uh, structure, which is Thanks. similar to yours. <clears throat> what do you what do you, what, so what's your thought then on the railroad property what is the uh, why is that significant to you what would you envision with that well again uh, qualify and just say from a pre-covid mindset um this huge opportunity to think that you could have uh you know mixed use development there you could have new citizens in the town yes a big portion of it's affordable but that that actually is a, a healthy thing i think in the long run um and the ability to live and and then go to work so easily or vice versa if you're in the mixed use part of it that you have some commercial or office type of space or whatever so that even people in the city are coming out this way by way of train um you know you can attract a whole a whole wealth of uh new bodies in town that may uh, add a lot of value um so both okay. tax wise but otherwise and okay. uh, help support your other commercial activities that are going on in the town <clears throat> uh i noticed on your uh your resume or actually it was in your reference comments uh an epa project in millville about a contaminated site can you just briefly tell us about that and what your experience is with dealing with contaminated sites and because uh, that's certainly one an issue that uh, <clears throat> Is going to be, you know, certainly could impact or will impact some development in Whitman. So they do have a contaminated site that's been there and identified for many years. It's been under remediation. They've had to provide, you know, water from a neighboring town to the homes in the area that otherwise would be on their well water. Um, and so that's a long ongoing process with EPA as well as DEP. Um, 
and uh, frankly, the activity is not um, overly significant. They've gone to try and pull some stuff out most recently, but it was the the efforts to remediate were fairly dormant for the for a number of years. So I can't say that I have a ton of experience there. I I will say that we we currently lease our uh, town hall from uh, you know our landlord that's the American Legion. And one of the challenges is what we're in negotiations of possibly acquiring the parcel from them. They, they're, 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 we're talking together. Um, but one of the challenges is that it, there are some issues that we have to address and um, it's a very delicate thing and could be quite challenging um, because of what's gone on over many, many years to that site before uh, we got involved. Right. Well, I guess I want to sort of come together on this topic of, you know, talking about brownfields, talking about uh, multi-use development uh, and, you know, 40R, 40S and, um, you know, how would you promote business in Whitman? How would you help businesses locate, you know, businesses and investment locate in Whitman? Well, I, I think the key, you know, a couple of things. One, you have to sort of come across as business friendly and supportive. Um, you know, my, given my background, I have some experience in retail, I have experience in wholesale, I have experience in a whole bunch of private sector types of ventures, manufacturing and whatnot. So I think that gives me a leg up uh, in some regards to uh, how to relate to businesses that are trying to come in and get going. In, and I'll give you an example in Millville, uh, unlike you, they have wholeheartedly endorsed uh, marijuana, cultivation and retail. Um, and they have two retail licenses available. We have, uh, both have been, uh, host community agreements have been entered into now with uh, two, two folks. And one's just waiting on the, you know, Cannabis Control Commission to approve their final permit. They're all ready to go. And the other one's just getting going. They've submitted their application to the Cannabis Control Commission. We recently signed their host community agreement. They're going to do grow and retail. And I was with both of them on Wednesday. And, you know, they're thankful that I'm actively involved with them because I understand business. Uh, you know, I, my personal views on the matter don't, don't really come into play. I, you know, the town has embraced the concept. And so I'm there to help wholeheartedly, you know, help them in their success as well as get through uh, the process. You know, uh, one of the guys called me because he was having trouble getting my building commissioner out there. So I helped uh, facilitate that uh, more timely action. Um, right now we've got, uh, you know, efforts to get the planning board on the new, new folks uh, to come around on certain, you know, uh, certain plans that the, the the folks have to do with their retail operation as well as their wholesale. And, you know, I've provided some input on suggestions of how they might uh, position what they really want to do and present that to the planning board. So, you okay. know, um, I facilitate. Okay. And I, and I understand, you know. Okay. Let's, uh, let's move on to another aspect of all the different hats that a town administrator wears. One of the big ones is, uh, personnel management. Um, what's been your, do you, have you, have you hired, do you, what do you look for when you're hiring people? Uh, what's been your experience with that? Well, we haven't done a lot of hiring in the town, um, quite frankly. And it's not like we have a lot of people. I've obviously hired people uh, in the real, you know, in the private sector. I was going to say real world, in the private sector. Um, but, uh, you know, what's my style? You know, I, again, um, Sometimes the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. So I'm working with folks uh, to help make them better at what they do. You know, they aren't, maybe they're not necessarily the most ideal, but we, I'd rather work with who we've got and help them grow in their, their you know, proficiency at what they do. And that's what I try to do. I'm a cheerleader. I may, you know, we're small enough so I can, I can touch, you know, touch base with most anybody, anytime, any day. Um, and, uh, you know, I've made friends, you know, I'm the boss, but I'm, you know, I, they're people I like, they're people I support, I've got their backs. Uh, you got to go through me before you can get to them. The, uh, but uh, would you agree that in, there are cases where people um, may not be 
have the skills? Yes. Yeah. So then you <clears throat> then you, you then you work through to see whether they're either going to develop and you, you you know. So I give them. And, and I'm, I'm using sort of a longer term view of my experience with people working for me. Right. So as well. Um, so you, you, I try to work with people, get what, get them to a point and absent the ability to do that either because they, they can't get there and they're in over their heads or they don't try to get there or they have attitude that prevents them from getting there. Yep. Then I, you know, ugly Peter can come out and it's not ugly, but I've, you know, I, yeah. I've, it's not like I haven't seen personnel so you, change. You're familiar with disciplinary procedures. Yeah. And... Yes. Okay. All right. What's your uh, collective bargaining experience? So, uh, you know, I've worked with the fire uh, um, contract in Millville, not many people in the contract, but still a contract that I'm working with, you know, the folks that local, whatever. And uh, we're, just beginning COVID's kind of delayed our police contract. <clears throat> I've worked uh, actively in, in Sherburne on the DPW contract, uh, the police contract, which was very innovative, and the educators contract. So I represented the town on the educators contract, and that was quite an extensive experience. We had a facilitator. It was interest-based bargaining until it gets to the money, you know, down the end of the money, money and then it's just bargaining. Um, but we did uh, two cycles uh, where there were no colas on the steps and lanes. And it was just colas at the folks that had already topped out at the high, high steps, if you will. I think we've talked about COVID. So that was our next topic, but we've, we've spent some time talking about that. Um, we'll get into sort of a um, um, lightning round, if you will, here. What, um, what do you uh, see is what excites you about what trends excite you about uh, municipal government? trends i i don't know i think it's really just the challenges and uh fully understanding what those challenges are and how you can go about them and i you know and i think obviously i bring perhaps uh you know i haven't grown up in the system if you will so i bring you know a, a different perspective i think that uh you know allows me to question the same old same old or the past practice and if there's a better way um I, I do think the, you know, municipal government, um, I like working with the people in it. You know, I like working with, uh, the, even, even I've come to appreciate working with folks at the state level where before I was a taxpayer and I thought, oh, government workers, blah, blah, blah. Now I'm, you know, I'm, I have an ap appreciation for what all folks do at all levels of government. And uh, they're always helpful. Our state senators, our state rep. Uh, in, in Millville, extremely, you know, always there for the community. And I think that's pretty special. Uh, so, I, you know, I like that. I like the people. I like dealing with, you know, the Board of Selectmen. Our Board of Selectmen is different people with different experiences, different perspectives. And, you know, watching them in action is and helping them to be, uh, you know, know, know what they need to know so they can make the right decisions. Uh, that they think are the best uh, in the best interest of the community. That's, a, you know, that's rewarding. Uh, likewise, the finance committee, you know, there, there's some smart people in our finance committee. I've watched your finance committee in action. Looks like you got some pretty sharp tax there as well. Um, and so working with them, I always find rewarding, you know. All right. Um, citizen relations in Millville, you did, you, you know, Millville was written up in the Globe actually a couple of years ago about uh, before you got there about the uh, lack of trust that was sort of existed in the community. What have you done to build trust in the uh, in the town? Yep. So again, you know, just you want people to understand that you give them uh, information, not misinformation, or try and help them learn from their misinformation, if you will, that they might be working with. Um, so I, you know, I get out and about. I love going to the Council on Aging luncheons and things like that. I, uh, right, right off the bat, I was asked to speak at their Memorial Day celebration when I first started there, and uh, you know, I came and talked about my dad. You know, shot down in uh, World War II. He was a bombardier and escaped and came home. And you know, not everybody on his B-17 did. You know, and 
people came up to me after that, like just, you know, everybody I encounter, they, they want the town administrator to succeed as my experience. And uh, so I appreciate that. I appreciate, you know, like your community um, in Millville, you have people who've lived there for generations. You know, we, we just had a woman who's turned a hundred. She, she's lived there her whole life. She goes bowling every week, except now in the COVID environment. She just turned 100. So it was a, you know, a proclamation and that sort of thing uh, provided by myself and the town clerk and then the board of selectmen. You know, we made it uh, Grace Burns Day in Millville on her birthday. It was, you know, that kind of thing is pretty special. Okay. Nice. It's community. You know, they're, they're communities. All right. So you, you get that part of it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, can I go back to the uh, collective bargaining for a minute? Uh, have you inter uh, have, uh, had to go through an arbitration process before the JLMC? No. Okay. No arbitration at the schools in Dover Sherbin during your time? No. Nope. Okay. Nope. Okay. The, um, you know, w you were talking about the uh, working with the uh, um, collaborating with the different departments and in, in state government and business. Um, what about the uh, the school? De well, obviously, the Dover Sherman gave the experience with the school department, so maybe we've already covered that uh, some. But what is uh, you know what's your what's your approach to dealing with interacting or inter uh, uh, you know with businesses and other organizations? Uh, how do you go about doing that? Well, so I'm just a, you know I'm available, and I you know to the extent it's uh, reaching out. I mean, it, it just. In, in terms of the schools in Millville, you know, first day, the first thing I did yep. was go visit the superintendent and the assistant superintendent, get to know them. And we have a good relationship. He invited me to a meeting just this week where, you know, he had to make a decision on whether to close the schools for the time in because they, they were, you know, too many staff were coming uh, positive and it's too many students. And uh, he wanted to have a Zoom call. He had a Zoom call with, uh, you know, both towns, town administrators, my counterpart wasn't there, um, and both towns, boards of health, and in Millville, the board of health is my assistant, <laughs> uh, is the assistant to the board of health. So she and I were there, and, you know, the full complement of the board of health of the other town and school leadership. And, you know, I just basically, I, I, I guess I, I'm just doing this as an example, saying this as an example, but I try to be supportive, as I say, they, they have many challenges. And, and so I, I just said, I, I, I truly appreciated the effort they put in to try and provide good education to their kids, get kids in the school as much as they can. And that reality is there's no such thing as a bad decision under this environment. You know, you, you got to make a call and I support the call. Would I make the same call in the same shoes? I don't know, but, uh, we can only be supportive okay. in terms of reaching out you know i guess i've gone out and met uh, business owners there aren't too many in millville but uh, i managed to meet one or two and you know well more than that but um and as i say i have that private sector experience so i can talk turkey with folks okay um <clears throat> i want to go back to finance for just one second uh, i want to something i wanted to uh, talk about when we talked about the excess levy capacity um in the case where that was an inadvertent, you know, um, uh, excess levy capacity. All right, so you build a budget uh, and then realize that um, you have excess levy capacity. Um, what do you, you know, in the spring you've approved the budget and then you find out you have excess levy capacity. Um, how do you handle that? I'm not sure, I guess. Uh, you know, I think you gotta say, what do we do with this? And uh, whether that's a short-term thing you want to deal with or whether you want to let it sort of flow through to the next year and see what happens. I, I, I'm not sure, um, quite frankly. Um, Thoughts on a, on a fall town meeting? Yeah, I think the fall town meeting is where you might have opportunity to do some things that you might have otherwise deferred. So, and, you know, most communities seem to, and I think you folks do have uh, a couple of town meetings a year. Sure, but we typically did not have a fall town meeting. Millville has one and we've already had ours. Uh, we've had, we've got our town meeting, uh, annual town meeting in at the end of June, just in time. And then we got a, you know, a fall town meeting where we modified some of the budget items based on what we understood the state was going to do that we had 
held back on because we didn't previously. Um, and we addressed one or more uh, lingering capital items we had deferred. And so we, we did those where we did some purchases out of stabilization and, you know, moved on, moved along. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Relationship with the board of selectmen. What would that look like if you were the town administrator? Well, I, I'm, I'm a fun guy. No, I'm a good, you know, I, I get along well with anybody. And again, I, I look to be knowledgeable so that they can be knowledgeable and that they can trust that they can say he's he's looking out for the best interests of the community each individual board member may have different perspectives they typically do and you know my job is to help them part of my job is to help them maximize that take advantage of whatever their different perspectives are and apply that um, in government, what one of the things I found that drove me crazy when I was sitting in the, you know, the selectman's chair, the advisory committee's chair, I used to hate having to, uh, if, if I didn't know what to ask, if people only answered the specific questions and they didn't anticipate what else I really needed to know on a particular matter, that drove me berserk. Um, so I try not to be that kind of a person. <laughs> Okay. I, I try to let them know what they need to know, even if they're not asking. Do you, um, how do you communicate with the board in Millville? Well, I'm free to, you know, we, we communicate by email. They're, you know, they're not on my case all the time. You know, they're, I think they're pretty comfortable that I'm doing the right thing. Um, we communicate by phone. We're obviously in meetings. I work closely with the chair. Um, one of the other members is the chair of the capital committee, so I have a significant interaction there. Uh, you used to get drop-ins of one or more. I uh, encourage that and uh, welcome that. Uh, we sit and chat and talk about things, and if there's something they need to know, I let them know. Okay, right. But I so, don't, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't uh, bog them down in minutia unless they want that. And uh, okay, all right. So you, uh, so if there's an event that happens in town or, you know, an incident that happens in town, um, what do you, you know, what do you do? You know, I make, I, I make call or text, um, uh, email, um, okay. some, some, you know, it depends on the, the form of communication they prefer. Okay. And, um, if you're, um, Sort of goes back to another question I had earlier about uh, accessibility. You're, uh, if you're, um, you, you would make yourself accessible. You wouldn't say that you, you weren't accessible. That's you correct. weren't available. You were yeah, and I'm, I'm accessible all the time. So my chair, you know, she'll send me a text to, can we chat? Um, and it might be, you know, over the weekend. And of course I'm available for that. Okay. And during the week you, you're in the office and right. available then too. Right. Okay. Of course. All right. Um, all right. I think I'm done with mine. Uh, board member questions. Okay. Randy, go ahead, Randy. Unmute. You're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, just circling back to something you just said, Peter, if it's something, uh, uh, the board needs to know, you let them know. Uh, who, in your opinion, de uh, determines the need to know? Uh, well, I guess that's me. That's my judgment, right? Um, and I certainly welcome input from board members. What level of need to know you you may have, you know, the board member may have. So I can't I can't necessarily, you know, read one's mind. So I try to and I don't want to overburden. So there's a balance and that, that requires communication. And I guess the other question would be uh, uh, where you are now in Millville is, is a town uh, manager role, whereas our form of government, uh, you would be a town administrator. Uh, collectively uh, dealing with five board members all with e equal uh, standing and, and voting power and decision-making power 
Uh, I just noticed you said you deal a lot with the chairs. I, how are you disseminating information to the, the members outside of the chairs you're dealing with? Right. So if there's if there's something that needs to go to everybody, email is the first go to that I would have. And then to the extent somebody might have a follow up, I deal individually with them. OK, um, I'm, not, I'm not a town manager. I'm a town administrator. Yes, I guess I'm a strong town administrator by virtue of the bylaws. I, you know, I did request a look at your bylaws because you don't have them online. And I emailed your uh, town clerk. She was very responsive. But, you know, I. I'd have to spend ten dollars to get your bylaws, and I didn't happen to be there when I could buy your bylaws. So I, I don't know what they are. Um, but I'm I'm a I'm a lowly town administrator in Millville. Uh, and then I guess um, just circling back to uh, finance, I, I do agree. Uh, OPEB is, is something that uh, should be a priority amongst the towns. Uh, However, how do you deal with um, the, the fine line between fighting for, and, and I didn't mind you saying fighting for, I noticed you backpedaled off that. I think sometimes you do need to uh, put, put up a, a fight for things you believe in. Uh, but how do you juggle the fine line or walk that fine line between service and making that commitment to OPEB, especially within the school district? where we see uh, education as a whole suffering, especially in this town. And uh, due to COVID could be, uh, challenges could be even harder. So would you maintain your commitment to OPEB over services? Uh, well, your OPEB is part of the services. It's a cost of your services, which unfortunately you're not addressing is how I would look at that, okay? So if you looked at your OPEBs at your regional schools, you know, they're pay as you go and they're neglecting to capture $4 million by my analysis of annual cost in their budget. And so here's, here's the best way I would describe that. And, and one of the reasons I got involved in government when I chose to be on the board of selectmen was um, in part to address this challenge for Sherburne, right? And, it, I did that because of my children, because I, I didn't want to get to a point where my kids someday said to me, Dad, what? Why? You knew about this. Why didn't you do something? So when <laughs> I walk around the school in Millville and there's, uh, you know, kids lined up to go to the cafeteria at lunchtime and, uh, you know, they're two year, you know, they're they're second graders lined up, all these cute kids. It's wonderful to see. It's a great environment. And then I think, you know what? we're sticking them with the bill that you know gets me going so in, in sherburn we at least got it took years but we finally got a, an amount put into the budget um, the operating budget to fund opeb our opeb trust fund right the amount was a hundred thousand dollars a year which was really a rounding error to what really you know what probably ought to be done and one of my fellow board members said, Peter, look at that. You did that. And I, I said, that's great. But it, you know, it really needs to be uh, more substantial because the challenge, I mean, yeah, it's a huge challenge for every community. Everybody's dealing with this. You've got the OPEBs, you've got, you know, the, the, the contract, uh, you know, uh, the contracts that you're facing with. I don't, you know, I have no sense of your, you know, class sizes or any of that sort of thing, but I do have a deep understanding of school budgets, school challenges, and educational challenges. I've been in educ you know, I've been in educational startups, you know, curriculum startups. I used to teach uh, way back when for beer money. I taught ma math and science as a sub teacher in in Natick. So I have a pretty good understanding of all of the challenges, and I'm we all got to figure them out, whether it's your community or, you know, Millville and Blackstone, you know, everybody's got to deal with it. So uh, it's not that I'm, I don't know what the answer is. How do you deal with it? You have to provide the services. You have to, you, you know, how do you define level services? How do you, I could get into that with somebody, you know, just let's talk about what is, what are level services and how you define that? And can you do the level services another way? Um, when I did the educators contract in, in Dover, Sherburne, uh, representing the town of Sherburne, 
one of the things I wanted to get in there, and they put it on the next go-round item, was to really look hard at um, online education. So here in this COVID environment, we're doing remote learning. I was the chief operating officer of a startup that did remote learning many years ago. We delivered the world's best content on the subject matter to a million kids at once in college, okay? So I know it can be done. And the challenge is, when do we face up to that? So, uh, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I, we could go on and on and I apologize for that. And it's important to me because I have children, they have children, somebody's got to pay for it and, and or somebody's going to get stuck with a bill that they can't pay for. That's how I view it. Other questions? <clears throat> yeah, I have a couple of questions for him. Um, we have uh, three pieces of property in the town of Whitman. Um, we have the Park Ave School, which was uh, given to the town to be used for educational purposes only. And when that building became uh, non-usable, it's just been sitting there for 15 years at least. Um, we have uh, the old dump site where back in the, uh, I would have to say 60s, it could be 50s, but I think maybe 60s or late 60s, it was uh, where the town picked up our own trash and we, we brought it there and, and, and put it there. It's a big, huge mound. And we ended up capping it. Uh, I assume that the capping of the 50s is not the same as the cappings of today when you do something like that. There are, there are uh, boards, uh, holes bored in where they're, they're wells, where they're checking it out. And then, of course, we got, as we talked about, the Regal property that's next to the T station that uh, had some issues with it. And the, the state came in and poured like 100,000 or whatever in it or whatever, made whatever and took out some of the, um, the problem areas. Those three sites, I would like to see the old dump site. I thought it would be a perfect area to put a um, solar panel farm that way and use the monies collected to pay for the electric bills for a uh, police station, fire station, town hall, senior center library. Unfortunately, we're afraid to even think about that, that we could be open up Pandora's box. That the, if we did that, the state may come in and say, well, know something, you're gonna have to spend $10 million in recapping, right? We have the Regal property, the same issue and of course the Park Ave School, I guess it's been in a battle in the courts to see if we can use it for anything else other than education in the town. And it's been so long that that building may have to come down. We don't know. What would you, what would you be able to do looking at those three issues that could benefit our town tremendously financially and economically? Yeah. Do you have any ideas? Well, ideas. I mean, I you know I don't know all the details, but I'll just tell you, Sherburn, we had a similar situation uh, in terms of a capped landfill, and we right there we had the transfer station, operating transfer station, right on top of por a portion of it. We did explore doing the uh, you know solar farm type of thing, but it wasn't you know the tr the tree lines were too close and so forth. So I think I think there are opportunities for solar farm, but we did have the same issue of being afraid of, ex and the words were exactly the same, opening Pandora's box of, uh, you know, we had to do resurfacing of the, uh, the transfer station pavement, and we opted not to go too deep on that because we didn't want to open Pandora's box. Um, on your school building, that sounds like a legal matter, you're right. Um, at the same time, you know, Millville, we, we have an old town hall that was condemned and is you know, we, we have to deal with it. And it's many years of looking, you know, there were committees put in place over the years <laughs> that worked very hard to explore how to repurpose it or re renovate it or reclaim it. And it never got anywhere. So part of it is the political will of the leadership of the town has to really put a stake in the ground. And I'm trying to help force that by saying, I'd like to see something by the Springtown meeting that we address what we do with that old town hall, which is either we're going to sell it to somebody that can do something with it, or we're going to tear it down and do something with the land, if you will. Um, on your train station, I think that's probably your, your higher priority 
objective to do something about. And I think that's very could be very exciting for your town, done right, um, and in lieu of the situation, the COVID pre, post, and whatever. You know, uh, I think that's a you, you definitely have a resource yet to realize in that location, and uh, that makes your town even more special. Again, uh, you know, what's your tagline for Whitman? People move in, but they don't move out. I think once people realize what your town's like, they you, you seem to stay, you know? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep. Anybody else? All right. Peter, I think we're, uh, I think we're all set. Um, you just want to say anything before we, we move? Well, two things. I No, I, I do appreciate your time. I know that's a big effort. It's a big opportunity for you. I know you have big shoes to fill from, uh, you know, Frank having served your town quite well for many years. Um, so, uh, you know, I appreciate this opportunity. You've got a nice community. Uh, I have friends that live in Hanson, so they're pretty familiar with you all. Um, and uh, so thank you again. Also, Bernie, hopefully the next time, for the next time I see you, I may not, I may be clean shaven. Or all right. Maybe I'll decide to keep it. We'll <laughs> buy, buy a razor. All yeah. right. So happy holidays to all. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Uh, all right. We ready to move on or do you need a minute? I'm on set, anybody? I'm ready. Okay. Dan, I'll let you do a welcome. Well, hi, Lisa. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Hi. Uh, uh, of course, you know everyone here, but just to let you know I'm here. Brian's here. Uh, Justin's here. Randy's here. Kyle's here. And of course, Sharon and um, Bernie's here. So uh, I guess we'll just get started. Uh, sorry that uh, our first applicant, uh, we took a little bit longer, but we're just getting used to the questions. OK. OK, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, Bernie, go ahead. Very good, thanks, Dan. Uh, Lisa, uh, good morning, glad to, glad to see you here today. Um, we have a number of questions. We have about a little, probably an hour, a little bit over an hour um, if needed, but um, why don't you tell us uh, why you're interested in the position? I mean, I think everyone knows your background, but you could even uh, take a couple minutes and talk about your background mm -hmm. and um, the um, why you're interested in becoming the town administrator. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Um, you know, I'm Lisa Green, um, your current interim town administrator. Um, I moved to Whitman back in 2001 um, with my husband and my son. And um, at the time, I worked in a travel agency, um, started law school. And as the years went on um, and the uh, travel industry changed, I made the decision to go to law school, uh, which I did. And in the meantime, as my son uh, got older, uh, had an interest in baseball. So he started playing baseball with Whitman um, while he was five years old. So I really started to get involved in the community at that time, uh, meeting a lot of the people because we were still fairly new in town. Um, went through the process, uh, finished law school, graduated, passed the bar, um, started working with a law firm. And then unfortunately, when the recession hit in the early 2000s, I was very fortunate enough to get a job with Social Security, working in the general counsel's office. Uh, we dealt with disability cases, and actually there were other cases we dealt with. Um, but in the interim, uh, my son was continuing up through the Whitman baseball program, um, and I was meeting more and more people, really enjoying the um, meeting the community, getting more into the community. And that's really what got me started into thinking about municipal government. Um, my first, I guess, chore was as we traveled around to different towns and saw their baseball fields, I noticed that Whitman's baseball fields, we didn't have any school boards. Um, and after talking to some of the uh, folks on the Whitman baseball and softball board, um, all, we're all in agreement and allowed me to spearhead a movement to get some school boards on our baseball fields. Um, I drafted and wrote letters to all of our businesses in Whitman and uh, we were fortunate enough to have donations from Whitman businesses and um, we got two scoreboards for our um, baseball fields located at the middle school. 
that was a very rewarding and fun experience. I wanted to get more involved. And when I read in the Express that the um, there was a position open for selectmen, had a talk with my mother, and she said, go for it. So I did. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be elected as selectman. And everything took off from there. My passion for municipal government just, just skyrocketed and took off from there. Um, spent five years as a selectman, loved every minute of it, learned as much as I could about municipal government. And when the opportunity uh, presented itself, when I heard that um, our assistant town administrator at the time, Greg Enos, was um, tendering his resignation, um, after talking with family and friends in Whitman, I made the decision to apply for the position uh, to leave my government job with Social Security and was very fortunate enough to be appointed. It's been a love affair ever since. Um, I love the job. I love the day to day challenges. Um, it's very rewarding for me to be able to do things for the town, um, to see it, to see it grow into a better community. And um, I have dedicated myself to this uh, to this field. I have completed the MMA and Suffolk certificate in local government and management and have um, con is continuing on in my education in public administration to obtain my master's degree from Suffolk. So when I'm finished that will have I will have a law degree and a master's degree in public administration. So I think that will give me some really um, super skills, experiences, um, and backgrounds to really make a difference in this field in this community for the town of Whitman. Uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, you know, um, your career, uh, where does Whitman fall into the, the arc of that career? Well, Whitman was my first step. Um, you know, like I said, I, I've lived here since 2001. Um, I have really grown to know this community. Um, I, I know many, many, many members in the community. Um, I've, I've um, really had a lot of fun doing things for the community. Um, you know, Whitman is, again, it's my number one because I'm here. I'm a stakeholder. I've raised my family. Um, I love it. I've been uh, really building up my house, um, <laughs> putting a garage for my cars. Um, you know, I, I jump at the chance to do anything that I can that will um, better Whitman in any possible way I can. Um, and an example of that would be the Great Pumpkin Classic Car Show that um, I am the organizer of. Um, when I heard that the Spooktacular Car Show, which has been a um, event in Whitman that was held for almost 20 years, wasn't going to come to Whitman anymore. Um, I was disappointed in, in hearing that, and I know a lot of people in Whitman really look forward to that. So took it upon myself to join forces with recreation and Dollars for Scholars to organize and put on our, car, our own car show. Um, very successful, was very well received, uh, received high marks from everybody in the community. Um, we held it a second year, again, same thing, and I look forward to be able to doing that. Um, it brought business to Whitman, um, you know, brought tax, uh, tax dollars, um, and just, uh, you know, people get to know Whitman by th those type of events. Okay. Uh, let's get into uh, the role of a town administrator. Um, as, the, uh, as town administrator, you're the uh, um, sort of at the top of the administration of the town. Uh, describe to us your style of management, your style of leadership. Okay, so management and leadership go hand in hand. Uh, management is more- Are they the same? No, they are not the same. Uh, management is more of overseeing the day-to-day -day operations um, and business, making sure it's done efficiently, um, making sure all the operations are, are uh, going smoothly and that there's no kinks in the system. Um, you want to make sure your bills are paid, um, your employees are all where they need to be, that the jobs are being done by each of the employees. Um, leadership, on the other hand, is your relationships that you're building with your um, colleagues, with your community, with the employees, with the department heads, um, with your, my superiors. It's uh, building, earning trust amongst all of those components. And with leadership, 
it's not just one style fits all. Um, leadership is a combination and a bundle of, of behaviors and actions. Um, again, and, and there's different components. Um, you can be a leader that focuses on collaboration, strategy, adaptation. Um, we have our quiet leaders or introverts, our ex extroverts or our loud leaders. Um, but what, you know, you have your strength driven leaders, but what's important is knowing oneself, knowing what your strengths are, knowing how to call upon those strengths um, and kind of mold them and fashion them to the diff to that component of leadership that you need that's going to get the task at hand done. Um, if it's collaboration to build a team, to, to chat, to uh, take on a challenge or a project, if it's strategic and adaptation to um, focus on some initial challenges or for instance, um, our school assessment, um, you know, that's gonna, that's gonna require a lot of collaboration, strategic type of leadership. Um, and when you're dealing with your employees or communicate, um, sorry, community, um, you know, that's gonna be your creative type of um, leadership. Um, it's important to have a, a, an idea of your emotional intelligence where you're um, focused on and you're really, you have compassion and empathy for what's going on in other people's lives on an emotional level, um, on a personal level, but at the same time, maintaining that professionalism and respectful where you're not showing favoritism, you're not blame, you're just, you're working towards a greater good to achieving the missions and visions um, for the town of Whitman. Um, so with me, as far as my style of leadership, um, it's always going to be a combination of those components um, that I'm going to need to put into motion um, to be successful at the challenge at hand. Um, you know, and, and with my leadership, what I will focus on is building a top-notch wor workforce here in Whitman um, providing quality town services. Um, I want to, you know, bringing calm and resolutions to any type of disputes or disagreements, um, attract economic development here to the town, um, and basically accomplish a well-managed and fiscally sound community that people can be proud of. Okay, I'd like to stay on leadership though, not get into all that just yet. Mm -hmm. Uh, what I want to understand is the way you were describing leadership, you're kind of segmenting, you're this type of leader, you're this type of leader, you're this type of leader. Uh, isn't leadership all of those things and uh, being able to, because you sort of segmented it out? Yes, it, it's a bundle. It's a bundle of behaviors and actions. Um, you know, it's all, it's all of those things. And, uh, you know, somebody who's a leader recognizes that not one type, not one area of leadership is, 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 going to accomplish, not always going to accomplish the task at hand um, that you may have to, you're, you're going to have to use some, some different components of leadership. Um, trust is, trust in relationships is, is monumental in, in a leader. Um, say for, you, you have to have trust in, in and from your, the community, your, again, your employees, your department heads. Um, and, and once you've earned that trust, they, you, know, you can enable others to act. You, you can um, encourage the heart that way. You can bring resolutions to disputes because you're using those leadership skills to um, address a, a conflict or challenge. So how do you build trust? You build trust by showing your values and beliefs. Um, you build trust by um, knowing, doing your homework and knowing what you're talking about not pretending that you know it all, um, you know, because that will get you in trouble. Being forth, straightforward with um, any questions, uh, basically, you're transparent um, with your with with how you view things. Um, there's no finger pointing. There, there's just let's address an issue um, and, and get it fixed, and let's learn from those mistakes. Possibly uh, look into policies. Uh, oh. Just. <clears throat> so in terms of the, uh, that's an interesting, in terms of the, the, the finger pointing mm -hmm. aspect, uh, what, uh, what, what aspect of leadership with, if a problem goes wrong, mm -hmm. what's the role of the leader? If something goes wrong, what's the role of the leader? 
Okay, so the, the role of the leader um, would be, I mean, so if we have a problem through employees, then you want to bring on your role of um, strengths and adaptation to understand um, the emotions that are going on. So, um, you know, with quiet leadership with an introvert, they take the time to think, to research and understand the problem. And when, especially with me, if you know, if you know that there's a history involved with the problem, you can kind of um, draw upon that knowledge mm -hmm. to be able to escalate and, and come to a resolution of the problem. Um, I can give you an example of that. Um, we, had a, we had a conflict between two department heads recently um, regarding pay of an employee for, for doing a job. And um, basically what was going to happen is either the employee was not gonna get, get paid appropriately or it was going, this was going to a problem that was going to hold up um, payroll for the entire town. So um, with, my, with, with my knowledge of history, um, my ability to identify the emotional intelligence of this, um, strategic and collaboration, I was able to approach each department head and, and speak with them and able to come up with a compromise with each department head so that we could get the employee paid appropriately and get roll, payroll moving so that it wasn't going to delay um, payroll for the entire town. Um, <clears throat> All right, what, uh, how do you encourage collaboration? Well, you encourage collaboration by um, talking about the project at hand um, and speaking with the people that you've identified that have the best talents and skills um, to work on that particular project. So you, and you bring a team together with those, using those skills. Um, all, of, all of our department heads and employees here in Whitman have individual skills, talents, experiences, and, and education that will allow them to come together and work as a team. Um, we have a fantastic financial team here um, that is gonna help us get through our, our budget this year, where it's going to be a very interesting year for our budget. Um, we have, uh, you know, we have COVID that's going on. So there's a lot, there has to, there's been a lot of collaboration with all the department heads with how we're going to deal with particular situations with COVID. Um, and it, it's just, it's just really um, bringing in all of those different talents to, um, for, yeah. to, to build the collaboration. Okay. Um, all right. Let's let's talk about um, the the the, um, the leader as a role model. Mm -hmm. um, how do you um, how do you handle being a role model? And uh, the example I would throw out there is that uh, certainly during this period of COVID, the one of the things that we're seeing in the news uh, repeatedly is public officials that. Uh, say one thing to their people, their uh, either their constituents or their workers, uh, and then they uh, proceed in a different manner uh, in terms of uh, compliance with uh, those COVID instructions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, not uh, not behaving properly. How do you? What's your feelings on that? Um, well, I, I'm always a person who um, will always be straightforward with people. Um, I will always look at the facts, the provisions, the protocols. Um, I will always, I will consult with the, um, the experts that we have, uh, the people who were our, um, that, that we have hired to provide us with guidance and feedback. Um, I'm not a person who ever does, says one thing and then does another. Um, I always will say what I believe is the best course of action. And if there are others that need to be consulted, I will consult with those. I will talk about my feeling for a course of action and see if they feel the same. If they have a different course of action they feel, I will definitely present that always. Um, but I will never go against, it. like I said, I will never say one thing and then do something completely different because that is the quickest way to lose credibility and trust um, amongst your, your, again, your workforce, your colleagues and department heads. And that's when you begin to arise suspicion of what you're all about. If they can't trust and count on 
that what you say you're going to follow through with, um, then again, they're going to lose faith in you. Um, and it's a quick way for you to have to explain um, why did you say this and then do this. If, if I come across a situation where I think it's going to go one way, but then find in the middle that something's brought to my attention and it needs to go a different way, I'm straightforward with that, with that as soon as I possibly can um, and will always rectify. Um, but your own, I'm talking about your own, you know, as a leader, your own personal behavior. My, my own personal behavior, like I said, I have nothing to hide. I am, yeah. um, you know, I, I am a wholehearted individual. Um, I, I have values, beliefs. Um, I'm a hard worker. I have an excellent record. Okay. Um, you know, I, I'm not someone that I think anybody would um, second guess or doubt, um, you know, when, it, when, I, when I talk or when I say something. Um, I, people always know where I am. Uh, again, I never have anything to hide. Yep. Okay. Um, I'm always here. And again, you know, my son went through the schools where he's well known. He's a very good baseball player. Yep. Um, you know, everybody knows my family. We, we, we help our neighbors. No, I'm just trying to get at the issue of uh, it, it, whether you live in the community or not. It's always a role model. The yeah. leader has to be a role model. Yeah, so. I, I've, like I said, I've been here since 2001. Yep. Uh, yep. I understand. I understand, no, the I understand the local connection. Yep. So um, what I want to focus in on now, though, is when we're talking about collaboration, mm -hmm. uh, a key part of that is um, uh, being being there. Yep. Uh, and by that, I mean accessible to the people around you. Do you, consider you. do you consider yourself to be accessible? And does that ever, do, you know, wearing the, being a town administrator, mm -hmm. I certainly know this from my own experience, do you have to wear multiple hats and there's a lot coming at you all at one time. Yes. But uh, so uh, how do you manage handling all that mm -hmm. and uh, being available to the people that need to be available to you? Um, well, again, the, the best examples that I can, I can put out there is um, my work on the, um, the classic car show. Um, I, 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 I put together in collaboration with Dollars for Scholars um, and Whitman Recreation that involved many volunteers. Um, I, you know, the day of the show, I was there at five o'clock in the morning with um, our recreation director helping set up. I was there all day. Uh, you know, I, I run around and we have walkie talkies. So anybody who needed me anywhere, nice. I was there. Um, I also took time. I, you know, talked with everybody, um, you know, walked around. We talked with people. I thanked everybody for being there and, you know, being a part of it. Thanked everyone who came to visit. Um, and again, you know, very, very successful. Yep. Um, anytime anybody calls me, and says that they have a problem. I know the town of Whitman. I will leave my office and go right to where the problem is. Um, another example, we had a gentleman on our street, called our office. He was very upset. National Grid was working outside his home. Uh, he was worried that he couldn't get out of his driveway uh, because of National Grid blocking it. He had a, uh, you know, a, a, uh, a daughter in school. He also was concerned about his wife who had some medical difficulties. I got right in my car, went to that street, talked to the officers involved who were there. I knew both of them. Um, we went to the gentleman's house, uh, talked with the gentleman and, and assured him when the time came that he needed to get out, he would be able to at, get out of his driveway. Um, and that's the kind of person that I am. Um, I've, I've had um, a lot of experience with streetlights. I had an elderly um, resident who approached me and said, you know, I'm very worried. I live at the end of a, of a, of a uh, dead end street and the street light outside my home is not on. Um, you know, can you help me? I sent people right out there to get that street light working, to get that area lit for her. Um, and again, she was very, very happy. And that's the kind of person that I am. And that's the kind of dedication I show every single day. Okay. All right. Uh, I guess I'm just still trying to get a, a handle on how you balance the, like with the car show, uh, mm -hmm. which wasn't, a, I mean, it, the town supported it, I guess, but it really wasn't a full town activity. Right. What, the, what's the, uh, I want to know as a town administrator, mm -hmm. uh, when you're dealing with a series of problems and there's a, uh, in issues and there's another problem that comes in, mm -hmm. how are you able to, and, and are you able to set that aside and deal with 
uh, being accessible to the department head, the employee or the citizen or the member of the board that needs you right then. Absolutely. I, I do have, I, I, I do have, again, I'm someone who recognizes their strengths. Um, I, I do have the ability to multitask. Okay. Um, I have the ability to recognize when an issue comes up that, that needs my immediate attention. And I, I am able to put something aside and deal with that issue um, and then come back and then go back to the other issues that are he at hand. And I'll tell you, there's always a number of different issues uh, mm -hmm. that come across my desk. Yeah. And then I'll get that one phone call that needs immediate attention. Right. And I, I do have, I have that ability. I'm very proud of my, very proud yeah. of my ability to be able to do uh, that, to multitask. Uh, how do you institute organizational change? <clears throat> Um, hmm. Let's see. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a tough one. Um, well, I guess first you, you have to come up with a roadmap of, um, you know, what type of change that you want to bring forward. Um, and then talk, have some conversations just to get thoughts and ideas from people who are going to be best to help in that type of a change. Um, I mean, if you're talking of, of organization as far as a particular department or um, a, a community aspect, it's gonna be a matter of, of kind of reaching out to that area and then starting the focus and, and building a plan and a roadmap from there on. Okay. What, uh, how do you um, motivate people uh, in simultaneous and, and hold them accountable? Uh, well, I motivate people through um, my energy, through, again, um, my love and dedication of this job. Um, I motivate people by, again, encouraging the heart, uh, being supportive of their operation, uh, making sure they have everything they need to operate in an efficient manner. Um, it, I want to make sure they have all the training and mm -hmm. um, that they require. And, again, enabling others to act where... You put faith in what they're doing. You know, they, they keep you, they, they keep you up to date and abreast of what they're doing, but you show that you have faith in their you have faith in their skills and their abilities. Um, you let them take a project and and keep running with it, but you, you're staying right there um, in check with them just to just to check into the process and see how it's going. And um, you know, when, when something is finished, you you, you have a you have something. Uh, tangible in your hand that you can show to other people and say, this is what's been worked on by this particular individual. Um, and again, letting them know that their talents and skills are absolutely appreciated. Uh, everything they do is appreciated. And that goes a long way, um, yeah. as well as thanking people for the services that they're doing here for the town of Whitman. Uh, that, that really goes a long way. Okay, let's move into uh, another area. Let's move into finance. Mm -hmm. uh, what's been your... Uh, um, experience, what's been your um, role in the preparation of a, uh, an annual budget? All right. Well, um, as the assistant town administrator, I've gotten to work um, hand in hand with um, our former town administrator uh, with the budget. I've always been able to uh, review the, our, our budget sheets. Um, and most recently, as our former town administrator was ready to retire, I took a uh, front role in actually um, setting up and, and plugging in the numbers for um, our budget for our department and um, looking through our, we call it our Article 2, um, yeah. to see where all the other departments are. Um, right now, I am full and foremost involved in the budget process, I'm working with our town accountant, our treasurer collector. Um, I have Basically, I talk with him three to four times a week. I sit with him and we talk over where all the uh, departments are in their budgets, uh, where we are in the process with our finance committee. Um, I, I keep a hold. I, I watch where our local receipts are coming in, um, our, our new growth. Um, I see what we have in budget deficits. We look for area, line item, line area, I'm sorry, um, line areas that we could, if we're facing a shortfall in one, uh, budget line, we come up with areas that we could possibly draw finance from. Um, sure. I know this year is going to be a very interesting year budget-wise for us because this is the first year of 
our new assessment, the new assessment process is going to take place with the schools. Uh, so we're waiting to see how, what that is going to do to our budget. Um, but I, I have lots of knowledge of the uh, Divisional of Local Services who are a great resource if you have any questions. Um, yep. Again, I just, I have many resources for if I have any questions. I'm not gonna say I'm an expert at it. Okay. Um, every, you know, uh, I, I can add and, and look at numbers and, and have um, enough common sense and, and knowledge and to look at numbers when say, and, and spot when something's not just right. But- um, How do you do that? What, look at the numbers? Yeah, well, let me go back. You, you mentioned that you your, your work this year uh, as uh, uh, Frank was leaving mm -hmm. was to uh, put the um, dollar amounts into the, you, you, I, I forget how you put it, but basically put the dollar amounts onto the sheet. Well, we have an Excel spreadsheet. Yep. Uh, we, we have Excel spreadsheet. So that was for the town, town administrator's office? Yes. Okay. Yes. What, all right. Um, the, uh, and, and when you say you, you put those in, mm -hmm. did you determine what those numbers would be or did you just put those numbers in? No, we, we make a determination um, based on, um, you know, we, we have some resources that guide us. We have a Madden report uh, that is a financial an analysis of the town yep. finances that we have in place. Um, you know, we, we the our finance committee uh, makes some suggestions on what they where they would like to see the budgets fall in, you know, as far as percentages wise increases decreases. Um, and, you know, there there's we look at history to see what our expenditures okay. have been yep. um, and, and try and determine what expenditures may be going forward. Again, this has been a very interesting and challenging yeah. year um, with yeah. COVID. And it, it, there's a mindset that we need to make sure we're staying within our means. Um, okay. What's the most important step in the budget process? Um, <clears throat> most important step is just to have an understanding where your town is um, financially and fiscally. Um, I mean, we, we, you, you have to have an understanding of, of what your budget parameters are and then build upon that. Um, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of factors that are very, very important. Um, but I, one of the most important is to have somebody um, who has, again, the uh, financial wisdom or financial skills and talents as a mm -hmm. part of your team that can help you through the process. Um, and you know, again, we, we have a great financial team that's able to move numbers around um, give you answers on questions with particular budgets and areas that make sense that you can present to people who are asking questions um, okay. or need to to look to see where we're at in the process. Um, it, it's good to have that team in place so yep. that the, the three of us can always work together. Okay, so but in terms of your role, mm -hmm. uh, let's let's let me ask a different way. Who does the recap sheet in Whitman? Our town accountant does the recap sheet. Okay, uh, what role do you play in the recap sheet? Uh, the role that I play is I review the recap sheet with the town accountant um, and look at and see how our actual figures come in based on uh, what our estimates were and then look and see, I mean, right now, uh, you know, we do have a deficit that we um, are facing and looking at our, our uh, budget sheets to see um, how other budgets are, are developing and to see how we're going to be able to pull from some budgets um, to close the, the deficit that we, we have right now. So how does the recap sheet relate to the budget? Well, the recap sheet will tell us what our, um, our current levy limit is, what our new growth is. It will tell us what our um, free cash is. Uh, it will tell us what our maximum. Well, it, well, that's, those are listed on that. It won't tell you what your free cash is. That's where you, you just put your free cash number into that. Right, which is certified. The free cash that you that you're using. Mm -hmm. Right. The the free cash that we have available. Well, it won't actually tell you the, how much you have available. That comes up elsewhere, but it tells you how much you're going to use on the yeah, recap yes. sheet. Yes. I mean, I know we, we have uh, just about one, little over one million dollars. Um, and how, much you, how much are you planning on using in the upcoming year? Um, 
I don't know that I have an actual figure on that yet because um, the, the budget is still in the process. Um, I know that um, there, there has been some, you know, with, with some the COVID expenses that we have, uh, there'd be some shortfalls in certain budgets that we will most likely need to use the free cash to supplement and overcome those um, shortages in those particular budgets. What criteria do you use for, what's your, in your opinion, what criteria should you use, uh, do you use to use uh, free cash? Well, our, our, our free cash should not be used um, to fund um, overall um, operating expenditures. Um, we, our free cash okay. should be used um, to fund our capital, which is needed in town. Um, okay. Okay, good. Uh, what, um, can you explain to me how Proposition 2 and a half works? Yes, well, Proposition 2 and a half is a limit on how much, um, how what the increase is that towns can um, tax your real estate. Um, we're, we're limited to two and a half percent as far as um, being able to increase uh, taxes on our real estate property. Okay. Um, <clears throat> is it possible for someone's an individual homeowner's tax bill to go up more than two and a half percent? Not without an override, no. If there is a, if there is a way, I'm not sure of it, but I can certainly do the research. I would certainly do the research, but from what I understand, it would not be able to go up more than two and a half percent unless there's an override. An, in, an individual homeowner, property owner. Yeah, I don't, I don't believe in in. Uh, I mean, I, I don't really know the answer to the, to about an individual property owner. I know in order to exceed the two and a half percent, um, the, the the town has to. Um, come forth with, for, with town meeting for an override to exceed the uh, two and a half percent on and a, uh, real estate and property taxes. And a, and a, and a ballot vote. That, that has to go, right. It has to go to town meeting. And then once approved by town meeting, it would go to a ballot to the vote, to the voters. Yeah. Or you could do it the other way too. You could go to the ballot and then go to the voters, you go to the uh, town meeting. Yeah, well, our town meeting usually is before our town election. But you could do it either way. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, Proposition Two and a Half has the limit on the tax levy, mm -hmm. not on the individual tax. Oh, uh, okay. The levy, or uh, property taxes, total levy that um, mm -hmm. that it limits. Um, the last few years, so not the last couple of years, but for a number of years, uh, Whitman had a situation where they had ended the year with excess uh, levy capacity. Uh, you, being from Whitman, being involved at the time. Do you know how that happened? Well, there were a lot of theories on how that happened. Um, okay. I mean, there, there was a, there were, you know, I, unfortunately I can't ex say exactly. Okay. Uh, there were a lot of theories of how that possibly could have happened, um, which had to do with ways that our former town administrator approached the finances. Um, and Again, it, it, it's still kind of a mystery exactly. Um, do, you get, do you have any thoughts on how what might have happened or how that might have happened? Uh, but not, not, not necessarily, it, let's put it this way. In a community that has excess levy capacity, I don't want to focus in on Whitman on this. Yep. In a community that have, has excess levy capacity, how could that happen? Somebody was just maybe too conservative with their their budgeting, um, and okay. And I, I, I guess I'm 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 baffled by it. Um, I you know I I haven't dealt with it okay. on my own by on my own. Um, I said there were a lot of theories of how it happened, and it could be that people were very very conservative in the budgeting, yeah. um, and maybe they didn't realize it was there. Um, and okay. then, you know, when they looked into it, did, did see it was there, yeah. but I, we, I gather there would definitely be some education, um, and, and training that could, could take place to alleviate something like that in the future. Do you know at what point you would determine that there was excess levy capacity? <clears throat> I gather that would be after the, um, the, after the tax rates, um, were set, um, <clears throat> Yeah. In that in that case, I, I'm sorry. I guess I'm falling short in this in this. No, no. I'm just you, again. We're trying to get a, a sense of uh, your your uh, understanding mm -hmm. of municipal finance. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Yeah, and that would probably happen after the property uh, values were set. You were able to determine what the new growth was. So, okay. All right. In a case like that, what would be the downfall of uh, calling for a special town meeting to deal with the uh, excess levy capacity? Or what reason would you not call in a special town meeting? Well, I, I mean, the downfall of that would be that, again, your, um, you know, your ability in finance would be questioned. Um, you know, people may, and then again, that may, again, that may arise some suspicions in um, your, your, your financial abilities. Um, and if you're not the person that's 100% in charge of it, your oversight of the people who are in charge of it. Okay. Um, so, I mean, if you need to call for a special town meeting for that particular purpose, that can definitely um, have some negative um, impacts on someone's credibility um, as a town administrator. Do you think it would be better to have, this is just a real philosophical question, you think it's better to call for a special town meeting and say that our um, new growth was higher and therefore we have funding and so we're going to utilize that money uh, to do something or do you think it's better to not call it which way is it more uh, problematic in terms of uh, financial acumen well I, I would I would approach it as that if you know if after everybody's best faith efforts um, that we did come up short um, with our estimates of our new growth uh, and our new growth came in higher mm -hmm. and we saw there was there, there was extra money there that that we had access to. Okay. If presented in the right in the, in the right way, I would move to, to I would call a special town meeting so that we could access those funds so that we wouldn't have shortfalls. Um, okay. Or that we wouldn't be in any type of jeopardy of not being able to meet ob financial obligations and debts uh, because we didn't move forward with that. Or, or put towards capital or towards yes. liabilities. <clears throat> exactly. Okay, All right. Um, what, what, what's your philosophy on funding OPEB liabilities? Uh, it's, well, it, it's a requirement. Um, rating agencies certainly look at OPEB where they're going to start looking at uh, a, a, a municipality's OPEB liabilities um, in terms of its ratings. So they want to see that you are making, that a municipality is making efforts to um, set funds aside to meet OPEB liabilities. Um, and again, it, that could have a detrimental effect on a municipality's rating where our rating agencies are paying attention to that at this point. Okay, uh, that you walked right into my next question. The, uh, have you had an opportunity uh, to uh, participate in a uh, presentation to a rating agency? Yes, I have. I have sat through two. Good. Um, okay. And I understand, you know, I, I understand that they do ask questions. Um, and again, it's a it's a team effort with your treasure collector, your accountant, mm -hmm. um, as they present questions. Normally, they they'll give us um, some a little bit of of uh, headway that um, you know the questions that were coming to allow us to prepare. Yep. Um, but I I, uh, I have sat right in those um, yeah. those types of meetings and presentations. So what are, what are the rating agencies looking for when they come out? Well, they're looking for, again, they're looking for our um, financial stability. They mm -hmm. look at our ability to meet our debts. Um, yeah. They look at, again, they, they will look at our um, ability, our, our, our tax increase, our you know, tax growth based on bringing in new businesses. Um, you know, they, they will look at things like that, our ability to generate revenue. Um, so they will look at that, and uh, I know at one point, one, one area that was a sticking point was um, the snow and ice um, deficits, and we've had to explain those. And one year where we had quite a deficit for snow and ice, it ended up being the year that we got over 100 inches of snow. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that was actually, that, that was a pinpointing factor. Um, to the deficit that year. And once we were able to explain that, you know, it's probably something that every other community faced yeah. with the snow and ice that year. Okay. They, they were happy and, and the explanation was reasonable to them. When you, so you, they look at uh, those types of uh, issues in the, in the, uh, the budget performance. Uh, what else do the agencies look at? Um, let's see. Well, again, you know, they'll, they'll look at the, um, 
the, the schools where we're part of a regional district. So in our particular case, they'll look at the schools. Um, they'll look at our, um, they, they'll, they'll look at our new growth. They'll look at our, our tax, you know, our, our, our yeah. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little out of words. Um, yeah. You know, they'll, they'll look at our tax, um, you know, our, our, our tax increases or decreases, mm -hmm. and they'll see if they're they're being stable and following what the financial market is doing at that point. Um, and if, if then they'll look at how our um, I mean, we're a member of the, the PARS uh, Public Access Retirement Services, mm -hmm. and they, you know, they review the the uh, momentum of the market and the the markets out there as far as, far as the financial stabilities or uh, the ups and downs that are to come yep. so they'll look at our ability to just stabilize our our funding and not have to draw from free cash or go into debt to um yep. to fund projects and, and and debt expenditures and things like that do they look at financial management absolutely um, they they um, actually had requested uh, a couple years ago that we put into place some financial policies. Okay. Um, and our treasurer, working with our treasurer collector and our former town administrators, we we had implemented some um, financial policies, which they did request copies of, and were satisfied with um, those actions that we took. Okay. What uh, what did the financial policies cover? Uh, it covered the um, debt expenditures. It covered. Um, sorry, you know, I, I haven't reviewed it, but I, it, it it covered how um, we would approach again um, liabilities such as OPEB um, <clears throat> and um, snow and ice things like that, um, and and make sure that we're being fiscally responsible with that and not. Just going off the charts and going in a direction that's not, in that's not consistent with what the markets and other communities are doing as far as their financial um, stability. Do you have a does do you have a stabilization fund policy or reserve policy? Um, you know, I, I actually I'm sorry to say I I don't know. I mean, we do have a stabilization fund um, that we. Basically, we, we just don't tap into it. We, we really hold yeah. that for a rainy day. Um, yeah. You know, and again, I, I don't know if, if the financial policies we have are specific to a capital stabilization or reserve fund. Um, yeah. yeah, generally a, a reserve policy would indicate how big you want the reserves to be and what, what per reason you would use those reserves. But I, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm I'm falling short in that area. No, no, no that's all right. Uh, it, it would be definitely, uh, you know, one of the things I would definitely uh, look into. Yeah, what's what's your thought? That I don't know. <laughs> what do you, what role have you played in fiscal forecasting in your positions? Um, to be honest, very little in fiscal forecasting. Um, okay. I, I have looked at, um, you know, again, what our town accountant and um, our assessors. Okay. Um, have put together for fiscal forecasting. Um, and then, you know, based on what I've seen and based on, on looking at our, our histories, um, er everything seems to be in line, <laughs> nothing falling out of out of sorts with what we've been doing in the past. What do you see as the, is, uh, do you see any advantages to spending the time on doing fiscal forecasting? Absolutely, yes, because it does, it gives you an idea of what you're, you know, where you are in your finances. Um, you know, if you, especially in areas such as personnel or capital or things like that, mm -hmm. knowing what you're finding, you know, knowing what your, what your new growth is going to be and what your, um, your free cash and things like that can allow you to plan, um, to complete some of the capital, um, projects that you had that, that are waiting in the wings or, um, you know, look, re look at your personnel and as a town that is growing, mm -hmm. Um, at a very, very fast pace, um, our population and our um, development here in town is growing at a very fast pace. Yep. Financial forecasting is going to be very important because we're going to have to look at some important um, decisions, such as our workforce here and our ability to service all of the new residents that are coming in with the new growth and possibly the new businesses as, as coming in as a result of that new growth. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where our financial forecasting is going to be imperative because if we're looking at 
that we need to add personnel or replace um, personnel who are retiring. Uh, that's where this is going to really um, be an advantage. Or, or determining collective bargaining. Uh, oh, absolutely. Yes. It's very, yes. Yes. Um, we have all of our town union collective bargaining contracts are uh, due to begin bargaining. So our fiscal forecast will definitely um, okay. that that's going to be a determining factor of what we are able um, to offer. Okay, but you don't have, actually. It's not a you haven't done any fiscal forecasting just yet on that. Okay, not how, um, not well, all by myself. No. How I, long I, out would you? How long out? How long out would you go with a fiscal forecast? How long would I go? How how long out? In years. Oh well, I mean, we we like to look at a five year. Um, okay. You know, you'd like to look at a five year, but it's very difficult. So three years is probably the best um, okay. that will give us an idea. Um, and, and then if we, if we're out three years, if, if things really start to go south, then we, you know, we have a three years look, but if you go up to five years, that's, it's probably too hard to forecast what's going to happen five years from now. Okay. Um, how far out do you go on your capital? Uh, our capital, we go out five years. Um, okay. We have a capital plan that uh, is, goes out five years and outlines our, pro our, our number one projects to our bottom projects. Mm -hmm. And your most important projects and your most expensive projects are going to actually fall in line with your three-year forecasting. Um, but it, again, if you go out five years, you might, be, you might be stretching yourself a little thin. Why would your most expensive projects lay out with your three-year forecast? Well, because some of them are... are almost in dire need. Um, and if you move forward with a project like that, that's going to have a, a real in, immediate oh, impact on the on the taxes to the residents. Right. But in terms of like a, a, a new school building or a new uh, you know, uh, DPW facility. Yeah. Well, new schools. Those, those would be, how would you fund those? Yeah. So the, those two, new school building would probably be have to be funded out for 20 years. But I don't really know how we would reasonably do a 20 year um, finding a forecast, um, then the DPW building uh, would probably be maybe a 10 year bond. Um, so again, it would be difficult, but you, you all, you know what you have right now. Uh, we know we're always going to have people who live in the town of Whitman. So we're always going to have a revenue coming in. I, I'm curious you know, why you would only, I'm curious why you'd only borrow, go out 10 years on a DPW facility. Uh -uh. Well, it probably would depend on how much. Um, again, I, I would I would talk with our treasurer collector and see what interest rates are, and you know, coupons are available, and um, what the what the impact is going to be on the taxes to our residents in their in their real estate property. Yeah, because you, the impact of taxes on with a ten year are going to be more. There'll be more. Right. And if more. you went out twenty. <laughs> Right. So what, I, mean, I don't know if we want to have two projects going out for, for, for 10 years, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, for 20 years. Again, it would just be something we, we would look at the different um, interest rates involved and, and just basically you do a, a comparison of, of what the impacts would be on a 10-year note, what the impacts would be on a 20-year note. And if we have two projects at the same time, um, again, just looking at the lesser project of a DPW building, 10 years, 20 years, but we know the middle school is going to be out 20 years to have less of an impact on the, on the uh, borrowers, on the, I'm sorry, um, real estate. Yeah. yeah. Actually, the great news is schools, you can go out even longer. 25, <laughs> I think it's 25. So um, do you, um, what are your thoughts on your water and sewer that are enterprises? Are they mm -hmm. enterprises? Yes, they are. What goes into setting the rates for water and sewer? Yes, it does. <laughs> What, what goes into calculating the rates? Oh, for water and sewer? Yep. Um, I actually don't know the full answer to that question. Um, okay. I know that, that as far as the water and sewer, um, you know, we're charged by the town of Brockton for our sewage, um, you know, for, treat, for our treatment of the sewage. Um, and there is a cost involved with the water. And so, you know, obviously we have to look at those costs, what it costs for to, to run the Department of Water and Sewer. 
Um, and we need to make sure that we are charging enough on water and sewer to cover those costs. In the case of Brockton, do they, do, do you, do you have a, uh, uh, I should know this. Do you have personnel that maintains the sewer lines in Whitman? We do. Okay. We do. Um, but you know, we, we, we have our, our own uh, Department of Public Works. Right. And we have the, the force main, the travel that brings our sewage from yep. Whitman to Brockton. Um, right now, that is actually, um, it, that's going to be a big project that the town is going to face mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the very near future. Yeah. Um, so yeah. you'd, probably, you'd probably include the debt service of that in your rates? Yes, absolutely. Okay. All right. All right. And, the, and the personnel within the sewer? Division? Yes, we, we have. Yes, we have the water department um, who it, anytime there's a water main break or anything like that in the town, those folks are the, t uh, are the people that go out and um, okay. handle those problems. But you, but you cover those people in the rates as well. Yes, yes, because you'd have you'll have depending on when you have you'll have overtime yep. um, that you'll have to cover things like that. Okay, but okay, but just the general salaries too. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. Yes, the, the salaries with um, the, the water and sewer cover the, um, the, you know, the water and sewer employees. Would you, would you include uh, their pensions, their, uh, a pension contribution uh, in that as well? <clears throat> or health insurance? Uh, no. Okay. no. Those normally are not covered in the, the water and sewer enterprises. Um, <clears throat> we, we, have, we have separate lines in our budget that will that, that cover those costs. Okay, but there's not an indirect cost uh, element to your rates that covers for the water and sewer employees and their pension and health insurance costs? Not that I'm aware of, but I, I'll have to check into that. Yeah, yeah, that could be a, that could be a, if it's not, that could be a, uh, some money um, for, the, for the general fund. Let's go into project management. What's been the most uh, complex project that you've um, managed? Uh, it has to be the streetlight project. Um, I managed the from the from the very beginning, um, attending a workshop on LED streetlights um, with a, a gentleman who presented that at an MMA conference, mm -hmm. um, and then learning about the benefits to switching over from your high pressure sodium lights to your LED LED technology lights. Um, I again, I, I, I get I earned a lot, learned a lot of knowledge through the MMA conferences and learned about grants, additional grants other than a green community grant that was available to help municipalities convert their high pressure sodium street lights to LED. Um, and I just I we're, we're since we're a green community, we were able to uh, apply for a grant for street lights and then join in with another community, uh, the MAPC. For their grants for um, conversion to streetlights to LEDs. So we were very fortunate enough to receive grants from both of those um, areas and um, basically coordinating the consultant, uh, yep. coordinating the supplies, uh, you know, the materials we were going to need, uh, keeping spreadsheets to basically document all of our spending as um, with that particular project coordinating the uh, vendor, the engineers who were going to um, handle the actual uh, construction or the actual um, transition um, of the streetlights to the Cobra, the LED Cobra heads. Um, again, I had to maintain and organize invoices yeah. for the, um, the, the grants. They all required reports. I also needed to uh, maintain the incentives that we were receiving from National Grid. Um, and again, um, keep learn what wattages we had, how many street lights. We have 856, we have a 33 floodlights. Um, uh, Warden, I'm sorry? Uh, I, I just wanted to kind of get into sort of the management aspects of it. Did, did it come in on budget and on schedule or, absolutely. okay. We and absolutely came in on budget. Um, okay. I, I think within pennies, okay. um, and in the process, we actually, um, it was uncovered that there was an issue with the wiring of those particular lights. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, and it was going to um, cost us an additional almost $88,000 to correct that problem. Mm -hmm. um, and with the grants, we were, I was able to um, get additional funding from MAPC in National Grid to help uh, with us a little bit with that extra money. Um, but with the grants that we, we had, the, the two grants, we actually were not um, too far, I say, in the hole with um, the money that, that it cost us to fix the problem with the wiring. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as managing all of that, I was the point person for the consultant. I was the point person for the project management at the uh, engineering company. I was the point person for the foreman. Yeah. Um, I was the point person for the police details. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. Again, the project came in basically, fortunately, the weather was cooperative because it was a January, February, early March um, project and the weather cooperated with us. Okay, so you were the point person on the project. I was the point person on the entire project. Okay, from right. A to Z. Okay, good. Um, and you, I know you're MCPPO, so that's, we don't have to get into the procurement aspect of it. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about economic development. Um, how would you bring uh, businesses uh, and new development to the town of Woodland? Um, well, you know, fortunate enough, I'm fortunate enough to have the, um, you know, the in-depth information that of the properties that we have in Whitman, um, where businesses may be interested. Okay. Um, we, we have a, 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 an empty school called the Park Ave School. That is okay. a building that's sitting there. It's, a, it's a, um, in a beautiful area. Um, attached to a park that um, I believe really will be a very, very attracted to a business. Um, and what type of business, I don't know. It, it may be a human um, services type of business. Uh, it may be a, um, you know, again, a, a, an educational type of business. I'm not sure, uh, but there is potential there and we just need to overcome some legal aspects of that building and then hopefully get it marketed. Um, you know, I believe in um, basically having, having contacts and, and resources. Um, and when you have those type of contacts and resources, um, you know, you can reach out to these folks and find out who, who's looking for something. Um, I mean, we, we have a property right next to a, a commuter rail station that mm -hmm. has great potential. Again, we, we have some challenges to overcome, but I feel in the near future, we're gonna be able to overcome those. Um, you know, possibly for um, a, a um, 40 r type of project, which would be a combination of residential with some, maybe some retail, some offices. Um, you know, our downtown area, <laughs> there's really not a lot um, left for, for economic development in that area. But yeah. we also have the Route 18 corridor, um, which is where most of our commercial and industrial is. Um, and again, it's reaching out to those resources um, or having them reach out to us and say, hey, what have you got available? Um, and, and we have. Um, okay. Do you have, which state agencies have you worked with on uh, any of these projects? I've worked with Mass Development, um, with the Metro South um, Chamber of Commerce. I've worked with um, Mass DEP, um, <clears throat> MAPC, Metropolitan Area Planning Council with right. Old Colony Planning Council. Um, yep. So I've worked with a number um, of, of different agencies. And there's also um, the Massachusetts Smart Growth Agency um, that I've had conversations with. Okay, all right. The, um, uh, the um, in terms of the, um, the 40R, uh, mm -hmm. how would you go about uh, doing that? Well, um, we, we need to make sure, again, we, we have the property available, we have space available for that. And, you know, a, a good way for it is to uh, do a procurement and put an advertisement in to see if there's developers out there that are looking for um, an, a, a parcel of land to develop such a, um, that type of a uh, development. Okay. Um, in our bylaws, I believe we do all have in one of our bylaws under our zoning, um, for allow for an overlay type of district. So that's there. Oh, you do have that, okay. Yes, yeah, so you know, that, that's already one. And then um, again, it's just some legal challenges and some ground pollution to overcome. Um, but the, the property next to a, a commuter rail station um, to me would be very attractive to a, to a developers looking for that. 
Um, I mean, here in, in the town of Whitman, we do have a we we have a lot of we do have environmental res restrictions where we have a lot of wetlands. Um, so as far as building new buildings, yep. that's going to be a challenge. But we have a lot of um, available existing structures too um, that that we can market. Okay. The um, any thoughts on uh, tax increment financing for uh, projects or other? financial tools that you could utilize? Yes, I mean, I have heard that other towns have offered that type of um, assistance. Um, again, that would be something that I would, I would talk with the Board of Selectmen, um, our, our um, building inspector and other towns to see exactly how they approach that. But it's very attractive to a developer coming in or a business coming in to help them get off the ground um, mm -hmm. and get running, so to speak. What role would the building inspector play in that discussion? Well, the building inspector, he, he's, he's extremely knowledgeable in every single area of a zoning bylaw that I may miss. Um, yeah. So, and, and he could have some ideas of, you know, how, where, where a property, where, where a business might fit best, you know, mm -hmm. to get them the best, um, okay. I guess the, the best, uh, I'm sorry. It would be more from a zoning standpoint than from a tax increment financing. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yes. So, you know, he would be the zoning and then our assessor would be a good point of contact to have a conversation with on, you know, the tax part part of it. Um, okay. okay. Again, I'm not a person who, who um, I'm not saying that I know everything. Uh, there's Nobody a lot does. that I don't nope. know. Nobody does. <laughs> I learn every day. And what's important is I know who to go to to get the answers. Okay. Um, you mentioned you've been working with DEP. I assume that's on Brownfields type? Yes, of it is. Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> yes, okay. I, I've, I've done a lot of work with DEP um, with some of the Brownfield properties. I feel I'm very knowledgeable um, in that area and hope that in the future that we could do something with the some of the brownfield properties that we do have here in Whitman, as there are a lot of resources out there. But th there's a process. There's some processes we need to follow um, to make sure everything is handled and done right, so it doesn't come back to bite us later. Okay. All right. The um, have you looked at 40s at all? A 40s. Right. No, I'm sorry, I have not. Okay. Uh, 40r and 40b, I, I have familiarity with, but 40s, I do not. You mentioned uh, when we were talking about finances. You mentioned the collective bargaining uh, mm -hmm. contracts are uh, um, what coming up, or uh, yes, we, we have six contracts that are coming up uh, for collective been, bargaining in the next the, the next uh, year. What's been your role in collective bargaining? I have sat at every table uh, okay. for every collective bargaining for every um, for okay. basically for every union since I came on board here um, as the assistant town administrator. Um, I know who comes to the table. I know who the culture. Um, I know who the the, the players are. Uh, I, I know the I, I know the I guess the personalities. Um, I, you know I know the um, agencies that they that they are um, affiliated with, and I, I realize um, the challenges that we face with some of our unions. Um, Have you been the lead? I have not been the lead, no. Um, generally, our town council um, and town administrator have been the lead um, on okay. those. Okay, so uh, council sits at the table at all sessions? Yes, they do. Okay. Okay. Um, what's uh, been your, do, any uh, uh, appearances with the JLMC or any arbitration cases you've been involved with? I, I have not had the opportunity of a JLMC. Um, in my four years here, um, I have had much exposure, though, to um, you know, civil service and arbitration. Much exposure um, okay. with, with those areas. Okay. And, yeah. and I have, a, I have, a, I have an understanding through my legal background on mm -hmm. the procedures and and how those work. And although you know we have town council um, who okay. represents us in that area, I'm always happy to provide any thoughts when I'm asked of, of how I view something um, right. based on research that I've done in my understanding of a pro of that particular process. Uh, what's been your approach to uh, hiring people? Um, 
Well, um, you know, my, my approach to hiring people I understand there's a process that's involved uh, and it depends on whether we are looking at a, um, a union employee or non-union employee. Um, I, I have had the opportunity to, uh, where, where we are experiencing some retirements and mm -hmm. you know, there, there needs to be some employees in place. So I've had the ex uh, experience of hosting internal jobs um, in compliance with our contracts. Um, and then based on where the, the, the opening is, the vacancy is, we have our elected department heads who take it from there. But um, I, have, uh, I have experience of posting jobs on Indeed. Um, I, I have the experience of drafting a, a job posting and submitting it to the Express. Um, yeah. I've actually just been a, um, a party to uh, job interviews for uh, an open position that we um, have just offered the um, position to. And okay. it, it, it's a great experience. Um, yeah, I, think, need, I guess I'm, want, I'm wondering what, your, um, what you look for in hiring people. Well, what I look for is I look for somebody that um, ha has knowledge. Um, I, 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 again, you know, being a community oriented person, I do look for somebody that uh, knows our community, um, that has some type of a, a connection to the community. Um, you know, when, when people come in from outside, I want to look at different aspects of um, their jobs to see if they would be a good fit here. Um, fortunately, I, I know town hall, I know our DPW, I know our fire, I, I, I know our area, our agencies and our departments. So um, when I when I look at people and their skills and abilities, um, I, I look to also see how they'll fit within the, you know, the culture of what we have. Um, I mean, it's hard to do on paper, but if you have somebody that's applying for, say, a veteran's off service officer position, and you have somebody that has private sector experience, um, very little military experience, but feels that they want to give back to the community and be a veterans agent. Yeah. Th there's more that needs to be in place to consider, um, you know, someone for that type of position. Have you had any experience with uh, employee with employee discipline? Yes, I have. Um, I, I, I have, and um, it, it's it's an unpleasant process, mm -hmm. but it's a process that, unfortunately, when you work with people, human beings, um, is yep. a process that needs that needs to happen. Um, and what's important is again um, maintaining absolute professionalism, respect, and tact in how you deal with it. Um, there is a level of being in tune to the emotions mm -hmm. that are going on. Right. Um, and you, you always need to maintain and not let any type of personal um, thoughts or feelings interfere with your ability to treat the person that's facing discipline, possible discipline, um, unfairly or fairly in any way. Um, and I, I, I can give some examples of, of um, my experience to directly handling those type of situations. Um, All right. All right. The, the, um, we're running out of time here, but does that, uh, does that apply to, uh, what's your philosophy on employee evaluations? How do those take place? Well, uh, I mean, we, right, right now we don't really have a set process. Um, for employee evaluations. Um, you know, unfortunately, what, ha what has happened is, um, you know, an employee just is able to continue doing their job until all of a sudden they're not doing their job. And unfortunately, we have found in the past that um, we have not been as good as we should have been with documenting um, shortfalls and in performance um, performance, um, attendance shortfalls, um, or uh, inappropriate behaviors. Um, and, you know, that just is definitely an area where I would certainly like to focus on um, definitely improving and, um, 
you know, bringing forward as, you know, something that I hopefully, um, if appointed, would like to really work on. Okay. Um, you know, because we find ourselves in positions where um, something has happened, and yet due to a lack of documentation or things like that, we find ourselves in a position to not be able to take the steps we would like to take because of the absence of that formal process. Okay. Uh, let's move on to, um, you know, you, you noted you went to the uh, MMA Suffolk Local yes. Government Certificate Program. Yes, I did. Great program. Yeah. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. <laughs> um, what's the most exciting municipal trend in your mind? The, the trend? Right, that excites you the most. Um, I don't know if I have just one particular trend. Um, right. you, know, I, 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 you know, I, you um, know, there's so many different areas where, you know, um, huh. things are growing. Um, you know, we, we're entering a, a, you know, the electronic era where a lot of, a lot of the business is, is being handled electronically. Um, okay. you know, right. that, you know, um, online permitting and licensing is, is coming on board. Um, okay. you know, we're, we're looking at, um, online, um, records keeping for mm -hmm. our animal control. Um, so, you know, those areas are very, very exciting. Um, it's okay. going to allow us to have a better idea and a, and, and, and a better view of accountability as far okay. as our employees that we don't see every day. Um, but if we have the electronic, um, <laughs> well, electronic paper trail, so to speak, we can see what, what, what's going on. So if we're faced with a, with a, uh, a situation, we have some type of paper trail electronically or paper that we can fall back on, um, to, to, you know, face yeah. those challenges. One of the certainly one of the more interesting trends that uh, is a re, sort of a focus on community engagement. A big part of community engagement is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, relating, you know, bringing citizens into the process and communicating with citizens. Uh, what's your strategy of communicating with the citizens of Whitman? Well, you know, here in Whitman, we do have a very active community um, as far as uh, our municipal government. We have a lot of people that are very interested in what the municipal government is doing. So. Um, Social media is, is definitely a very um, solid tool uh, for getting information out there to our residents. And, you know, especially with our, our younger generations, we have our Generation X, Y, um, no, <laughs> you know, our millennials, and then our, now our new generations. They, um, they pretty much almost run their lives through social media to find out information almost immediately. So, um, and then of course your old fashioned ways, uh, picking up the telephone, um, again, getting in your car and driving out to meet somebody who has a, um, an issue that they, and they, they can't make it to you, but they, you know, they, they need some help and they, they need that, uh, you know, in human, human being interaction. Um, okay. Let's talk about the relationship with the board of selectmen. Uh, mm -hmm. what's, what do you envision as the role as the relationship with the uh, board of selectmen? Uh, and how would you communicate with them and keep them informed? Um, well, I, I believe that I, I, I again, um, hopefully have earned a um, trustful, respectful relationship with the Board of Selectmen, being a former Selectman myself. Um, I am in the office every day. So, you know, there's many levels of communication to keep them informed, which includes um, email, although, you know, you need to be very uh, mindful of um, not violating any type of an open meeting law um and um just you know the selectmen always come in and we have chats and i will update them or again they're able to call me to get any information ask any questions um it, when they ask me to um, perform some research uh, gather some data for them so that they can make informed educated decisions i feel that i have risen to the task um, and continue to strive to always meet the information that selectmen need so that they can make an educated decision on uh, different agenda items, agenda items that come before them. Um, I am always at all of the meetings. Okay. Something and, happens, something happens in town. Uh, do you, how do you get, in, what do you, 
do you feel it's necessary to contact the Board of Selectmen and let them know that something has happened? Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I always like to give them an FYI uh, type of um, background on what's happened. Um, and, you know, it's it, sometimes it might not be immediate because I need to see what it is first. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to unnecessarily um, upset anybody or, or put out information before I have a full grasp of what it is that we're dealing with. Um, and then I will put out an FYI type of email just to give them an idea, especially now with COVID, um, there's always um, always situations that arise that, that kind of circle around COVID. Um, you know, I feel it's very important for them to be updated, updated with that. Um, and then anything else that comes about that um, they, they need to be up to speed so that um, they, they don't find out. And sometimes if I don't have the information I don't want to present it to them because I know I'm not going to have the answers that they're going to have, you know, to their questions until I do have a full knowledge of the information so that I can answer any questions they come back with. Let me, let me ask you a question on that. Would it be better to notify them and say, I don't have all the information, but this is the situation. Uh, and then they could ask the questions that they want answered to so that then you would be able to get that, but at least they'd be aware of it. Yes. Yes. Um, I, I need to I need to move um, feel that it's important for me to move in that direction. Good. Good. <clears throat> All right. Um, I have one more question that I skipped over and I'm, I apologize for that. Uh, when we were talking about the finances, uh, we were discussing Proposition Two and a Half, um, and uh, we talked about the levy uh, that uh, and how that. Do you know, do you know how the levy is calculated? <clears throat> well, it would be the um, it, it's it's. What's allowed under proposition and a half. So 2.5%. Uh, we, we can't exceed 2.5% of the new growth. Um, it would be it's what are um, like our debt exclusions. And like I, I'm just trying to picture it. Um, yeah. So we have our debt exclusions, we have our the new growth, which can't can't exceed 2.5% um, as far as increasing the taxes. Um, Sorry, I'm I'm falling short here. Uh, what our current our, well, we'll take our current our I mean, our yeah. current levy. Right. All right. So we will um, take our new growth, yeah. and then we calculate two point five, and then we will um, bring in our um, like our, like our estimated new growth. So I'm sorry, I, I um. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Okay. Um, yeah, it would be the. the Prior year levy plus two and a half percent. Plus half, right, right. Plus plus new growth. And then our, with with our debt exclusion. exclusion. Right. Yep. Okay. Good. Uh, I'm all done with my questions. If somebody else has questions, would like to answer. Uh, yeah, Lisa. I the, the questions that I asked the prior uh, applicant was basically dealing with uh, land use, and you've already touched on the Park Ave and the Regal site. But um, but you know how I feel about the old dump site. I know that uh, you have, you and Frank have driven up top. Um, do you think that there could be an interest with doing a solar field there, to help, um, uh, take care of some of the uh, town uh, expenses as far as uh, electric electrical expenses for town buildings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I mean that that area was we, we did look at that area um, for a possible solar field. Um, yeah. There are some challenges with the with that um, old dump site, um, whereas records on how and when that was capped are very difficult to find. Um, we have yet to find them, and it was brought um, to our attention that. We want to be very careful with that type of area because we, if we were to fall under the radar of the environment, the DEP, they may they could require us um, to go in and clean it up and recap it properly using our own funds. So um, it, it's not something that's out of, um, you know, completely out of sorts. But we we have to approach it very carefully to make sure we don't we don't hurt ourselves in the process and end up with that expense of being ordered by the state to clean it up and cap it properly um, because we can't seem to locate the records of when and how it was capped um, to begin with. Okay, thank you. 
That's all I have. Anybody else have any questions of Lisa? Yes, Justin. I'll, I'll ask, uh, yeah, pretty much the same question I asked the uh, last candidate. So um, phrase it a little more, more locally for you. Uh, you know, Whitman proposed a um, hiring a consultant to research a 40R uh, zoning area back in, I think it was 2017. Um, and I think it was put forward by the Economic Development Committee. Were you involved in that at all, in that process? I was not, unfortunately, okay. no. I, I actually don't even know who they, um, if, if they did hire somebody, I don't even know who it was. Um, I know we had a LSP that we hired for the Regal property, and I, I was actually involved in that that part of it. Um, but specifically for the 40R, I, I have no knowledge of who it was or anything that was done on that. The, the article failed at the special town meeting, so it didn't um, didn't go forward. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> that's why. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, not a problem. Anybody else? Uh, I, I would just say uh, my, my question to the previous candidate, Lisa, was regarding uh, uh, juggling uh, OPEB and basically, uh, you know, if you would get into uh, paying more for your OPEB liabilities or balance, how, how you would balance that with. Uh, uh, general services. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think your answer was was not as uh, uh, eyebrow raising as uh, the previous candidate to me. So I, I don't feel I needed to uh, ask that at, at this point to you. But that was just my one question to the previous candidate that uh, in order of fairness in the process, I, I felt I should at least uh, I don't know, uh, say that to you. If you wanted to answer it, that's fine. But I think your answers uh, were good enough for me on the process. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Lucy, oh. Yeah, oh, wait a minute, good. Brian. Good, Brian. Uh, Lisa, um, I, I didn't ask this question obviously to the uh, uh, gentleman before because it's not pregnant, but uh, do you think that as a, a resident of the town, um, it makes a difference to have someone in the position of town administrator um, because you almost have a stake in the game or does it really matter in that so, or that somebody who um, is of equal stature and experience uh, could come in from another town not knowing what the, the players or where the bones are buried, so to speak, um, uh, would make a difference. Well, you know, there, there, there's, there's two arguments. I mean, there, there's, there's two arguments to that. Uh, some people will say you don't want to live in the town uh, because you'll never get a moment's peace. Um, I don't agree with that. Um, I have, you know, I, I love the town I live in. And I think to me, it's a huge um, advantage because I am so, I'm so accessible, accessible out there. Like again, I, um, the advantage that I have and what I bring to the table is we get a call from somebody and there's a situation going on. I can get in my car and go to that location and look at the problem and see and come up with a resolution to it. Um, I don't know if you'll get that out of other candidates who are not, don't live in the town again. I live in the town, I've raised my family, I'm a stakeholder, I'm a voter, I'm a taxpayer. Um, I'm, all, and I'm also involved in, in uh, events that go on in the town. Um, so any decision or anything that, that goes on in the town impacts me personally as well. Because you know I, I live on a street here in Whitman in a house, single family home. So any, any in, something that impacts anybody else is gonna impact me as well. Um, and I think that's what gives me the, the advantage. Um, and again, so with the knowledge that I have of the town, I know the businesses, I know the makeup. Um, I, I think that's what I bring to the table is I feel that for me, living in the town I work with is, is the best possible, possible scenario. Um, and again, yesterday during the snow, I was able to get in my car, drive five minutes to town hall, um, conduct the, the, you know, the uh, business at hand um, and then spend time here again and then drive home five minutes. Um, it's great because, you know, I am five minutes away from 
addressing or being available to address any situation at hand that requires me to be there um, in person. Great, thank you, appreciate that. Anyone else? See nothing, I guess that's right. it. Is this, I guess Bernie, group. this is our break? This is our break, Lisa, if you want to just say a couple of closing, well, you probably just gave your closing comments, so we'll let it go with that. Um, no, I would also please like to thank everybody um, sincerely for, for um, allowing this, me this opportunity. Um, I know it, it hasn't been easy for anybody. It's, it's been, um, you know, uh, it's been a run, it's been a process. Um, I, I've completely enjoyed my time as the interim town administrator. Um, there's lots to be done. Um, as far as um, for the town and I sincerely hope that you feel that I have lived up to any expectations that you have for me and hope that you um, see me as the person to bring Whitman into the bright future. Um, and again, thank you again very much for this opportunity and I look forward to um, hearing your decision on Tuesday. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, break for lunch. Okay. Justin, this is your job. Yeah, so uh, everybody please turn off your, Lisa can leave, but everybody else can okay. please turn off your cameras and, and mute, um, and I'll put up a graphic. <laughs>